Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon. The Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night, Pops Blue Ribbon presents you with a front row seat in America's favorite summer theater. So, while America's famous producer, writer-director, Orson Welles, entertains you, pour yourself a tall, frosted glass of Pops Blue Ribbon and enjoy at the same time great entertainment and this truly great beer. And now, Mr. Welles. Tonight, the Mercury brings you two great American short stories. The first, as per last week's promise, is by Sherwood Anderson. His loving study of puppy love at the turn of the century is called I'm a Fool. Well, it began at 3 o'clock one October afternoon in 1912 as I sat in the grandstand at the fall trotting and pacing me at Sandusky, Ohio. It was a good hard jolt for me and it all came about through my own foolishness, too. The summer before, I'd left my hometown with a fellow called Bert French with two horses as campaigning through the race meet that year. Gee, it was fun. We got to a county seat town maybe on a Saturday or Sunday, and the fair began next Tuesday, and you took your horses to the track and fed them. You got your good clothes out of a box and put them on. The town was full of farmers gaping because they see you as horse race people, and all the dudes come around asking questions, and all you did was to lie and lie and all you could, you know, about horses you had and lie and say you owned one. Gee, it's... Oh, this is what I want to tell my story about. We got home late November, and I promised Mother I'd quit the races for good. There's a lot of things you got to promise a mother because she don't know no better. And then as I started to tell you, the four races came to Sandusky, and I got the day off and went. And I had on my good clothes and my new brown derby hat and a stand-up collar. I had $40 in my pocket and three 25-cent cigars. That was bought me at the West House by a fellow with a cane and a Windsor tie. Gee, it was fun being on a track again. What do you get for climbing again? Gee, it was fun being on a track again. There was my old friend Bert French standing around with his horses. Hello, Bert. Well, hello, Joe. Hello, strange. How have you been, Bert? Oh, never better. Say, you got any money, Joe? Sure. I'd like to watch it grow. Like it fine, Bert. All right, come over here, then. I'll tell you something. Now listen, Joe, in the second race, the 218 pace, there's a horse I'm handling. Abu Ben Adam. There he is, number seven. That yeah. gelding's fast as a streak, Joe. Belongs to a fellow called Mathers in Marriott, Ohio. We got him marked at 221, but he can step in 08. 08, gee. In the first heat, don't you touch him. He'll go around like an ox, hit to a plow. After that, you get a right down and lay on your pile. Thanks, Bern, a lot. Uh, have a cigar? Yeah, thanks, Joe. <laughs> Well, sir, I went and bought myself the best seat I could get. What a popcorn, Chris, the strawberry bars. Right in front of myself, I, I could see that there was a fellow with a couple of girls, and I was about my age, and the young fellow was a nice guy, all right. He had a sister with him and another girl, and the sister looked around over his shoulder. Accidentally, at first, not intending to start anything, she, she wasn't that kind. And her eyes and mine happened to meet, you know how it is. Gee, she was a peach. She had a soft dress, kind of blue stuff, and she blushed when she looked right at me, and so did I. <laughs> she was the nicest girl I ever seen in my life. Well, pretty soon the horses came in for the 218 pace, and there was Bert's horse in among the rest. How we go down this time? Well, you know as much about it as I do. What about the brown one there with the long tail? He's kind of cute. Hank, ma'am, that mare couldn't beat a streetcar. They looked up kind of surprised, but they didn't seem mad. And anyway, I've done it now. Might as well go on. Maybe I can help you folks. There's a horse in this race, number seven. The, that horse is as fast as a streak. Uh, 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 Boo Ben Adam, his name What's is. What's his name? Uh, Boo Ben Adam. But look, don't go betting on this first heat, because he'll pace it like a lame cow. But when the first heat is over, go right down and lay your pile on a Boo Ben Adam. He'll come right out and skin him alive. That's what I told her. Gee, and... What did that young fellow do but have the nerve to turn and ask the man next to him to get out and change places with me so I could sit with his crowd? I want you to meet Miss Eleanor Woodbury. Pleased to meet you. And uh, this is my sister, Lucy Wesson. Oh, my name's Wilbur. Uh, we're from Tiffin, Ohio. Popcorn, kids, and 
I suppose it was there having such swell names got me off the trolley, and then that girl, you know, how funny is there's something in that kind of nice clothes and kind of nice eyes she had, and the way she looked at me a while before over her brother's shoulder and me looking back at her and both of us blushing. I couldn't show her up for a boo, could I? I made a fool of myself. That's what I did. Glad to know you all. My name's Walter Mathers. How do you do, Mr. Mathers? I, I'm from Marietta, Ohio. And you really think this horse is going to win, Mr. Mathers? Then I told him all the smashingest lie you ever heard. I said my father owned this horse, you know, Boo Ben Adam, and it was supposed to be a secret because I told him our family was proud and never had gone in for racing that way. Here's what I think of that horse. Uh, Wilbur, will you do me the favor when you go down to place these 30 bills on a Boo Ben Adam at whatever odds you can get? I'd go myself, but I, I just soon our trainer and his wife didn't see me. I'm supposed to be here keeping an eye on him. Uh, incognito. And sure enough, a boo-ben Adam went off his stride up the back stretch and looked like a wooden horse or a sick one and came in to be last. People, what I tell you, like a lame cow. You certainly were right, Mr. Mathers. Then this Wilbur Wesson went down to the betting place out of the grandstand, Miss Woodbury with him, and... Lucy Wesson and I was left alone together like on a desert island. Gee, Miss Lucy, I'd like to show you our place down at Marietta. It's, it's on a hill, a great old red brick house with the stables behind it, way up on a hill, up above the Ohio River. Oh, I like rivers. Her eyes were shining. And then she kind of, with her shoulder, you know, kind of touched me. You know how a woman can do. They get close, but not getting gay either. You, you know what they do. Gee. I began to wish I was on the square with her and to see what a fool I'd been. There wasn't any way of getting myself on the square now. There ain't any Walter Mathers. Like I said to her, there ain't ever been one. But if there was, I bet I'd go to Marietta, Ohio and shoot him tomorrow. And then... Wilbur Weston come back with Miss Woodbury and he'd gone and bet $50 on this horse and the girls had gone put in $10 each of their own money too. Gee, I was sick then but came out okay. There he goes! Who Ben Adams stepped the next three heats like a bushel of spoiled eggs going to market before they could be found out. Yeah. He's coming up! Hi, Bill Adams! Hi, Jerry! up! got nine to two for our money after the race. We had a hack downtown. Wilbur stood us a swell supper at the West House and a bottle of champagne besides. And there I was with that girl, big boob that I am. And she wasn't saying much. I wasn't saying much either. One thing I know, she wasn't stuck on me because of that lie about my father being rich and that lie about all that. There's a way you know, you know. Perhaps some money. There's a kind of girl... You see, just once in your life, you don't get busy and make hay, then you're gone for good and all. You might just well go jump off a bridge because what it means is you want that girl to be your wife and you want nice things around her like nice flowers and swell clothes and you want her to have the kids you're going to have and good music played and, you know, not rag time. Gee. Well, there's a place over near Sandusky across a kind of bay. It's called Cedar Point. And after we had supper, we went over to it in the lodge, just the four of us by ourselves. Is that train, Wilbur? 10.40. And is that the last train? Yeah, that's the last train. Oh, Shaw. Over at Cedar Point, there was a beach you could walk along, get where it was dark, and we went there. She didn't talk hardly at all. Neither did I. I was thinking how glad I was my mother was all right and always made us kids learn to eat with a fork at the table, you know, and not spill soup and not be noisy and rough like a gang. You see around a racetrack that way. Hey, Lucy! Lucy! We're going up the beach away. Are you coming? Oh, go on ahead. We'll wait for you. 
were you here? I feel kind of tired. Don't you? Oh, yeah. I guess so, Miss Lucy. Well, why don't we sit down a while? It's nice here. Lucy and I sat out in a dark place where there were some roots of old trees the water had washed up. Feel that wood. How smooth it is. Like silk. And there was a watery smell. And the night was like... As if you could put your hand out and feel it. So warm and soft and dark and sweet. Like an orange. After that, the time till we had to go back in the launch and I had to catch their train was nothing at all. Went like winking your eyes. Got to go to the train now. Will you kiss me goodbye? She was most crying then, but she never knew nothing I knew. She couldn't be all busted up as I was. Gee whiz. Sometimes I wish I'd never been born. <laughs> yes, you know what I mean. We went in the launch across the bay to the train like that, and it was. It was dark, too. What are you thinking about? You know what I was thinking? What? Well, I, I was thinking... that you and I... could get out of this boat... right this minute... and walk on the water. It sounded foolish, all right, but I knew what she meant. And quick, we were out at the depot, and there was a big gang of yaps crowded and milling around like cattle, and how could I tell her? Oh, it, it won't be long, because you're right, and I'll answer you. I got a chance like a hay by in a fire, a swell chance. I got to answer you. Maybe she'd write me down at Marietta that way, and the letter would come back and stamp on the front of it by the USA. There ain't any such guy or something like that. Whatever they stamp on a letter that way. Well, goodbye, Walter. Goodbye. And thanks for the tip off. out and cried like a kid. Gee, I could have run after that train, made man of war look like a freight train after a wreck, but sucks a mighty, what was the use? Did you ever see such a fool? Me trying to pass myself off for a big bug and a swell to her? Did you ever see such a fool? I'll bet you what, if I had an arm broke right now or a train had run over my foot, I wouldn't go to no doctor at all. I'd go sit down and let it hurt and hurt. That's what I do, big fool that I am. Why was I such a boob to go and tell such a lie that couldn't ever be made straight to a lady like her? If I'm not a fool, you just go and find me one. I'll quit working and be a bum and give them my job. I don't care for working and earning and, and saving for no such boob as myself. <laughs> just heard part one of our Mercury broadcast for tonight, I'm a Fool. We offer you another famous American short story for part two, maybe the most famous of all. Like our first selection, this is a study of a terrible mistake, but there all similarity ends. 
clearly Sherwood Anderson's hero lived down his mistake and lived happily ever after. The same, however, cannot be said of the murderer in Edgar Allan Poe's monologue, The Telltale Heart. That's next on the bill, but first here's Jimmy Wallington with some sound conclusion on the subject of picnics. Out here in California, it's always picnic time. Unless, of course, we happen to have a, well, an extra heavy dew. So, as a Californian and an old hand at picnics, I want to tell you there's nothing which puts over one of these outdoor banquets better than plenty of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. Yes, that potato salad, those hard-boiled eggs. I like the devil kind myself. Those cold cuts. Everything just naturally tastes better when blended with those never less than 33 fine brews. And you know why? Well, it's because Pabst Blue Ribbon has just the right flavor for a picnic. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clear, sparkling with a real that there's no finer beer. Picnic time or any time in them. So if your dealer is unable to supply all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like, why, just keep on asking for blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now Austin Wells brings you his Mercury production of The Telltale Heart. True! Nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been an M. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It's impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. For his gold, I had no desire. I think... I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. I was never kinder to him than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it. Oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, so that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head. <laughs> you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man took me a whole hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, <laughs> cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon that vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight, but I found the eye was always closed. And so it was impossible for me to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me. But his evil eye... Every morning. 
morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he'd passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. To think that there I was opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. He fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me. He moved on his bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back. But no, I did not draw back. I kept pushing the door steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in the bed. I kept quite still. And I said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done night after night hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight (laughs) groan. And I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been saying to himself, it's nothing but the wind in the chimney. It's only a mouse crossing the floor. Or it's merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. But it was all in vain. Because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern, so I opened it. He cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily until, at length, a single dim ray like the thread of a spider shot from out of the crevice and full upon the vulture eye. It was open. The eye was open, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed on it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. Now there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound. Such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well. It was the beating of the old man's heart increase my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. And then smiled gaily. Find the deed so far done. 
But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. Stone, stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. waned, I worked hastily. I took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited his corpse between the scantling. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. When I'd made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock. Four o'clock was still dark. Dark as midnight. Huh? A knocking. A knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. What did I now to fear? There entered now three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them I... I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chanted familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale, and I wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied that ringing in my ears again, but still they sat and still they chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued until at length I found that the noise was not within my own ears. It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I talked more quickly, more vehemently. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations. But the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung the chair from which I'd been sitting and braided it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder. Still, the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no! They heard, they suspected, they knew. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must free or die louder, Mark, louder. Violence! I shrieked. Dissemble no more, I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. It is the beating of his hideous heart. You have just heard Dawson Wells in his Mercury production of The Telltale Heart. Mr. Wells will return in just a moment. But first, let me again remind you to be patient with your dealer when occasionally these days he is unable to supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like. He's doing his best. You can be sure of that. Yes, and here's something else you can be sure of. 
Every single bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon you do get will, as always, be the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. Yes, every foaming, frosty glass you enjoy will, as always, have that famous Pabst Blue Ribbon flavor. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with a real beer taste coming through the way you like it. So keep asking for blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now, Mr. Wells. Next week, Moby Dick. Until then, the mercury remains, as always, obediently yours. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Saturday Night Theatre. A Sybil Thorndike Festival, in which Dame Sybil stars in some of her favorite plays. For the first in the series, we present The Foolish Gentlewoman by Marjorie Sharp, adapted for radio by Donald McQuinney. The Foolish Gentlewoman. He keeps that up all day. Uh-huh. Oh, why not? Sunlight, blue sky, cool garden, stately white house, all rural conveniences, only eight miles from London. And peace. Well, who wouldn't want to sing? Oh! Hmm, apparently Simon Brocken. What on earth can Isabel be up to? Poor man. His city clothes were hardly designed for this setting. His garden chair is not quite comfortable. He's being kept waiting. And at the best of times, he's not the best tempered of men. He likes the old-fashioned conscientiousness, the old-fashioned integrity. Today, he can't find them. All he can find is slapdash work, slipshod thinking, bribery, corruption, and the black market. Or so he says. However, Mr. Brocken. I brought you some tea. Oh, thank you. I'm sure Mrs. Brocken won't be much longer. She's had to take Bogey to the vet. What, is that creature still alive? Um, that's <laughs> Jacqueline Brown, oh, Jackie, yes. Isabel's companion. And this is Isabel's house. Simon, Isabel's brother-in-law, is here by special invitation. Isabel's been pressing him to come for weeks. Now that the bomb damage to his own house is being repaired, he's taken the plunge and there he is. Still waiting for Isabel. However, Jackie's welcome is warm enough, and she seems to organize the household quite well. She learned how in the ATS. Oh, I've forgotten. I'll get some cake. Humphrey, tea? Humphrey's on holiday. He's Isabel's nephew from New Zealand. He's just been demobilized. He's taking a rest before going back to schoolmastering. At the moment, he's sunbathing. <sighs> Good Lord. Yeah, quite so, sir. Good afternoon, Uncle Simon. Good afternoon, Humphrey. Put that towel around you at once. What are you doing here? I'm staying with Auntie. Are you uh, expected, sir? Well, certainly I'm expected. The bomb damage to my house is being repaired, and in the meantime... Pernicious old boffin. Oh, oh, I quote Humphrey. And I dare say Jackie would agree. Neither of them is particularly anxious to have the repose of the White Lodge disturbed, for various reasons. However, Uncle Simon will undoubtedly be spending most of his time in the city drawing up vindictive wills. Meanwhile, one must have tea. Dear, I must go and finish picking the peas. They're for dinner. Oh, yeah, I'll help. Oh, Excuse you. us, Uncle Simon. Where oh, is Isabel? Uncle Simon's all right, of course. In fact, as Humphrey has been heard to say, Uncle Simon is always perfectly civil as long as he isn't spoken to. And he always, in any circumstances, wants to be alone. He thinks he's alone now, as a matter of fact. But... Would you like any bits of bomb? Uh, what? Oh, what may you be? I'm Greta Poole. Me and Mum's the caretakers. At least we was the caretakers before everyone come back. And now we... we oblige. Oh, we shan't half be glad when they all clear out. Your mother should be glad to find herself still in employment. OK. We... One doesn't see much of the Pools. However, they speak for themselves, or rather, Greta does. Mum will doubtless emerge in good time. Out. Meanwhile... Do you want any bits of bomb? Thank you, no. I don't either. I used to collect them. Oh, it's funny what you'll do when you're a kid. 
It was Mum's idea. We thought they'd make nice souvenirs, but they got too common. You ought to have been evacuated. Not me. I stayed with Mum. A lady did come after me once, but I cried and cried, and Mum cried till she went away. And the next time she come, I hid in the attic, and Mum told her I can't discover them. Oh. Of course, she saw me about again in a day or two, and I told her I'd come back because the other kids was all infectious. So she finally gave up. The woman was undoubtedly attempting her duty. I dare say, but you shouldn't have said Mum was keeping me to dodge the call up. Mum wanted ever so to be around. She'd look smashing in them little caps. Yes. Well, she just couldn't bear to leave me. But she joined the ARP. She, she was outgoing messages. Huh. I trust she didn't leave the house empty at night. Oh, no. Mum told the chief warden she had a little girl, and he agreed straight away I oughtn't to be left. So, so I was a real advantage to oh, her. Oh, really? And we made ever such a nice place in the cellar, like, like a nest it was, with mattresses all round. Eh? Uh, uh, well... We took mattresses off all the beds. We, oh. we didn't think anyone would mind. No, no one would have minded. It was lovely. We used to creep in whenever the bombs got closer, and Mum used to tell me the stories of all the movies she'd seen. She remembered the dialogue and everything. Really? And, and sometimes she went on at six in the morning, and, and then we'd make tea first, and sometimes the moon was still up when the sky was getting blue. Like, and, 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 and if there was snow, the air was cold and silvery yes, and, and much thinner than usual air. Like, and, and the snow crunched under our feet. And, and surely your mother didn't take you with her? Didn't she? Oh, well, no, of course not. But, but she told me about it. She tells me everything Mum does. Jackie, I'm back. Ooh, well, sit down. Uh -huh. It seems that Isabel is back. Good. Now we can get on with the play. My dear Simon, it's how lovely to see you again. I do hope you haven't been waiting too long. I said I'd be here at five, and I was. Yes, dear, but you might have missed your train. Dear Simon, you know, I simply have to take Bogey to the vet. This time it's not only his paws, it's his ears, too. Uh. And don't say he ought to be shot, dear. Bogey's only nine. Which, if one year of a dog's life equals seven of ours, makes him exactly the same age as you are. Oh. Well... I took Bogey to the vets, and then on the way home, which was really what made me late, I popped in to ask Dora Tremaine up. I knew you'd want to see her again. Why? Now, don't be silly, dear. You've known Dora Tremaine all your life. We were all young together. Of course you want to see her. Simon, I wanted to see you weeks ago, but you wouldn't come. Thank you. I prefer my own roof as long as I have one. What did you want to see me about? A sermon. A what? A sermon. Well, you know what a sermon is, dear. About a month ago, I heard one. Uh, I gather the occasion was unusual. Well, I'm not a churchgoer, as you know, dear. I just worship nature. But when Jackie was going last month, I thought I would too. Well, I just thought I would. So I went. And there was a sermon. Yes, there usually is. What was the text? Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you that, dear. You see, remember as a child, one got into the habit of not listening. Well, I wasn't listening to this one. I was thinking about food. But I did suddenly, right at the end, hear him say something. He said, Simon, it was a common error to suppose that the passage of time made a bad action any less bad. Uh. He meant, don't you see, that because a thing had happened a long time ago, it doesn't make it any less base if it was base at the time. He meant that however long ago... Yes, yes, I take the meaning perfectly. It's not so revolutionary an idea as you seem to think. Oh, but I never had thought. Do, do you think it's true? My dear Isabel, of course it's true. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, here, Humphrey and Jackie. Oh, Simon, don't you think they look rather sweet together? Shh, dear, don't tell me now. I had no intention of telling you. We picked the peas. Oh, thank you, dear. Let me look. There are more, but I was thinking of tomorrow. Oh, dear, that doesn't look much for five. Well... You mean four? Jackie, mm -hmm. I believe we'll make these do. Then there'll be some for Sunday. Oh? Is someone else expected? Well, yes, dear. I've asked Tilly Cuff. Tilly Cuff? Uh, Humphrey, will you run into the pantry and fetch me a bowl, and then we'll shell the peas out here. Tilly Cuff? Any bowl? Top shelf, right-hand side. Tilly Cuff. Oh, don't keep saying Tilly Cuff in that silly way, Simon. You know who Tilly Cuff is. Why on earth should you ask her to dinner now? Not just to dinner, dear. She's coming to stay. To stay? 
You can't have seen her for years. Oh, I haven't. Not since she left us in 1913. But we always sent Christmas cards and I wrote to her last address. Why on earth should you ask? Because I chose to. Oh. I can't find it. Oh, I'll come. Well, here's Dora. Oh, good. Humphrey, go and get some clothes on. And Jackie can bring the bowl. Oh, Dora, I am so glad to see you. And look who's here. Simon. Well, well, well. Good afternoon, Dora. Simon Brocken. Well, you, Age. Hmm? I suppose it's living amongst all those deed boxes, my poor Simon. Uh, none of us are young as we used to be. Uh, true enough. I am 56, but I hope I'm not petrified. <laughs> Well, 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 well. Do you know what Dora does now, Simon? She's the receptionist at Madame Esme's beauty parlour. Good Lord. And Madame Esme told me, she told me the last time I went in, Dora, that you're absolutely invaluable. Well, certainly I'm invaluable. I am the woman who never had a facial. I sit there in all my natural decrepitude, and after one look, our clients hasten to enrol for a course of tinting and massage. <laughs> oh. And you know, Dora's got the dearest little flat over the ironmonger, Simon. It's perfectly delightful, and much more convenient than this. Oh, well. If I've come down in the world, at least I came down with a wallop. You know, we run like clockwork, Simon. It's quite wonderful. The pools are so good. We all do our part. There's never the least difficulty. We're going to make you so comfortable you'll never want to leave. Mrs. Brockham. Oh, I'm so sorry. Mrs. Poole's just given notice. Oh, dear. Why? Oh, I think it's because of Miss Cuff. Oh, well, perhaps I'd better come. I'm so sorry, Dora. Do forgive me. Oh, certainly at such a crisis. Uh, Simon and I will entertain each other. I'd better say to it's no good offering her more money. I mean, she don't have to pay income tax. Oh, wouldn't she? Then I'll tell you what I said. Simon. Oh? Isabel has something on her mind. I've noticed it for the last few weeks. Women can be very trivial. Isabel has invited Tilly Cuff, if you remember the female, to come and stay. It's an obvious mistake, and I dare say she's now regretting but it. But of course I remember Tilly. I remember her father. My dear Dora, Tilly was an orphan. My dear Simon, even orphans have had parents at some stage. Oh. Now, Tilly was the offspring of a bad hat and his housekeeper, who must have had a pretty bad bargain. The bad hat, as you called him, was a cousin of Isabel's mother. And when Tilly was orphaned and brought to live here, she had nothing but the clothes she stood up in. As Isabel's family feeling must be very strong. Oh, that it's lain dormant a considerable time. She tells me she hasn't seen the woman since 1913. That's when Tilly was packed off to Switzerland. No doubt they'd had enough of her. Yeah, but she was a quiet, useful little thing. I don't see why Isabel should be in a fan tod over the prospect of seeing her again. Well, I don't want to see her myself. Oh, crab. Oh. I hope Tilly turns up frail and forlorn and charming, and I hope you lose your heart to her, and I hope she breaks it do you a power of good. Dora, Dora, I wonder if you could say anything. Mrs. Poole is simply being unreasonable. She won't even listen to me. Oh, not I, my dear. I'm no use with the modern domestic. I keep thinking they're paid to do as they're told. Simon. No business of mine. Oh, I know it isn't, dear, but a man always has so much more authority, and the Pools think so much of you. Nonsense. What would you do? dear. Mrs. Poole always remembers it was you who engaged her for me. Oh, please, Simon. Mrs. Poole, Mrs. Poole, will you come out here a minute, please? Mr. Brocken wants to speak to you. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Poole. I'm glad to see you again. Thank you, sir. You appear to have looked after this house admirably. It's agreeable to find one's first good impression so amply justified. There, yeah, Mrs. Poole. Thank you, I'm sure. But now, just as I pay my first visit here, just as your delightful small daughter has made me welcome, I learned that you wish to leave. Really upsets me. Well, I'm sure we don't want to put you out, sir. Well, but you... Tell me your reason. Well, you never know. You never you know see. what? Well, you can't tell. Another lady in the place... Well, you never know, do you? Nonsense. I'm sure Mrs. Brockett and Miss Brown have never been other than helpful. That's right. That's right, sir. They're, they're... And that a third lady will no doubt lighten your work still further. Aren't you comfortable here? Oh, yes, sir. I didn't mean to suggest that... Well, it's just that we don't like the idea of a change. Well, if that's all, to oblige me, Mrs. Poole, reconsider your decision. See how things turn out. Okay. If you say so. We'll have a try. That's right. Thank you. I'm sure that's the best plan. Just have a try. Okay. 
Well, there's something in being a lawyer after all. Simon, you were wonderful. Oh, the woman merely wanted handling. It was an impressive spectacle. Isabel, I must go. What time does Tilly arrive? Oh, dear. Quite soon. Now, don't bother to see me off, dear. I know my way. Bye-bye. I do. Oh. Isabel, how long have you asked this woman to stay? If you mean Tilly Cuff. Naturally, I mean Tilly Cuff. How long do you expect her to stay? As long as she likes, dear. My dear Isabel, you have a most commendably kind heart, but in this case it has led you astray. Now, I suggest that the moment she arrives, you should make it quite clear she isn't expected to stay longer than a week. Oh, I couldn't do that, dear. I couldn't really. What beats me is why you ever looked her up again at all. No one's particularly fond of her. No one wants her oh, here. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, good heavens, what's the matter? I merely made an observation. No, it's not that, dear. It's not that at all. Well, then what the deuce is it? <laughs> Well, I shall be glad to tell you, Simon, if you'll stop walking about oh, all and right. sit down and don't shout yes, at me. Yes, yes, my dear, dear. You know, you know, Simon, I've always tried to do my duty. You had a sound upbringing. Oh, thank you, dear. So had you, and you've kept it up so. That's why I wanted to ask you about the sermon. Sermon? What sermon? The one about the passage of time. Oh, yes. The passage of time not making a bad action any less bad. Uh, I hope you might explain it away. Because you see, Simon, I did once, a long time ago, do a base act. How long ago? More than 30 years. Oh. Then if it has produced no consequences so far, there is obviously nothing to worry about. Oh, but it has, dear. It has produced consequences. You must let me tell you, Simon, you really must. Uh, do you remember, just before the last war, a Mr. McGregor? He was a subaltern in the Gunners, a friend of Mark's, and he stayed with you on one of his leaves and came to one of our dances. Oh, I have a vague recollection of him. He was wonderfully good-looking. Uh, I don't remember that. No, perhaps not, dear, but he was. He was fascinating. He stayed with you a week. It was in the spring of 1913, and we saw him nearly every day. <laughs> you sound as though you'd been in love with the fellow. Yes, I was. Huh? That's my only excuse. I was 19, and I fell in love with him, and I thought he was in love with me. I dare say I was very vain in those days, but I, I was pretty, wasn't I? Well, you weren't bad-looking. And when he came to see us every day and really paid me a great deal of attention, I don't think I was so unreasonable. The only thing was the time was so short and he was so shy, I thought he might be afraid of Papa. I mean, I thought he couldn't screw himself up. Ah, probably it had to penny. Oh, is he head, dear? His father was McGregor's oatmeal biscuits, so I knew it wasn't that. But it might have been lack of opportunity, because, you see, I never could get rid of you and Mark. Well, the day before he left, one of the maids told me he'd been over before breakfast by himself and waited about half an hour in the stables looking at the horses, and then went off again. Well? Well, of course, I remember telling him that I often went out early, though that day I hadn't, so you could imagine how furious I was. But the morning after, the last morning of all, I was down at half past six. Oh, it was a beautiful morning. The maids were all in the kitchen, but they'd pulled the blinds up, and the hall was full of sunshine. It, well, it, it seemed to go to my head. I felt absolutely certain he was coming to propose to me. So I went to open the front door, and there in the box was a letter. Mr. McGregor had come even earlier than I'd expected. I knew the writing was his because you'd written in our albums. Only, only the letter wasn't for me. It was addressed to Tilly. I couldn't believe it. You remember your big grey envelope, Simon? You know the paper was so good and stiff, the gum scarcely held. Well, without meaning to... The flap came away so easily. I found myself opening it. I opened it, and I read the letter. It was a proposal of marriage. He asked her to marry him. I couldn't believe it. I can't believe it either. He'd hardly seen the girl. Well, I suppose he saw her every time he saw us. But it's quite true, Simon. Here's the letter. What? You kept it? Well... It didn't really belong to me, did it, Simon? So I couldn't destroy it. It begins... My dearest Miss Cuff, 
Your modesty and shyness make it difficult to speak to you, especially among so many people. I do not even know whether you regard me with liking. Even as I write, I fear I may be frightening you. So timid and sweet and gentle, my gentle lass. Good heavens. Let me plainly ask whether you could ever consent to be my wife. We are all coming up after breakfast to say goodbye. If you can give me the least encouragement by word or look, I will at once speak to your guardian. If not, you need not fear I shall trouble you again. Believe me, dearest Miss Cup, your devoted Ian McGregor. God bless my soul. Yes, that's just how I felt. But no one ever fell in love with Tilly, not even curates. I thought perhaps it was a joke. Well, what happened? I went upstairs again, and there was Tilly coming down. I thought, oh, how dreadful it would be if she made a fool of herself, accidentally, you know, by putting herself forward in any way, when you and Mr. McGregor came. I thought that you might make fun of her. <coughs> yes, I know, dear, but that's what I thought. Or rather, that's what I made myself think. So I said, oh, by the way, Tilly, Mr. McGregor's coming off the breakfast to say goodbye. And you must give him a last chance to flirt with you, too. And then I went upstairs. And, of course, when you all came, Tilly simply wouldn't speak to him. And he just went away. You behaved very badly. Yes, dear, I know. What did you hope to gain by it? Well, I thought, after Tilly had gone, I thought perhaps Mr. McGregor would come back and stay with you again and and really fall in love with me. Well, he didn't. So you'd probably made no impression on him at all. You merely deprived Tilly of a possible husband. However, you have now relieved your mind, you'd better forget the whole business. Oh, but I can't. Not since I heard that sermon. I mean, I must do something. That's why I've asked Tilly. So I now perceive. I still think it a mistake. The damage is done, my dear Isabel. It was done... Thirty-five years ago. But, dear, the passage of time... Yes, I know, I know, and I've said I agree with you. The point is, there is now no action you can take. Good heavens! Humphrey, how long have you been there? About five minutes. Isabel, do you realise this nephew of yours has probably heard every word you've been saying? Well, I don't mind. It saves me telling it twice. Don't you think I'm right, Humphrey? There can be no argument. You see, Simon, young people are so much cleverer than we are. Oh, then you'd better consult Miss Brown as well. But as a matter of fact, dear, I told Jackie yesterday... Well, had I known, my dear Isabel, that you were merely seeking a wider audience, I should not have wasted my time listening to you. However, as I have done so, I will repeat what I said earlier. To offer Tilly Cuff a month's holiday as amends for a frustrated life is simply insulting to her and a nuisance to me. So, as you cannot now put her off, at least cut her visit short. But of course a month's holiday wouldn't be enough, Simon. What I'm afraid I'll have to do, only you wouldn't let me tell you. Oh, come along, Jackie. We'll shell the peas here. Isabel, for once, I should like to hear the end of a sentence you have left unfinished. Oh, yes, yes, of course, dear, but I can talk just as well while I'm shelling peas. What I was going to say was, I'm afraid I'll have to give Tilly all my money. Nonsense! No, it isn't nonsense at all, dear. I have defrauded Tilly, and now I must try, as you say, to make amends. If it hadn't been for my wickedness... Tilly would be Mr. McGregor's wife. One moment. Would you mind telling us upon what, after giving away your income, you propose to live yourself? Oh, I shall manage. Well, how did Dora manage when she lost all her money? Dora? Bah, where is she now? Behind a counter in one shop, living in rooms over another. Oh, well, perhaps I could live there, too. I shouldn't at all mind living with Dora. She's so cheerful. If I kept just a hundred a year, and two can live as cheaply as one... Oh, is that a horse and a sparrow? Oh, Dora is rather horse-like. We might do very well. 
A hundred years, all that Dora has. What you'd rather forget is that Dora is also played by Madame Esme to advertise her decrepitude. Oh, dear, you know she isn't. That's just Dora's amusing way of putting things. Dora enjoys herself there. Whether Dora enjoys herself or not is beside the point. Isabel, listen to me. You have an income of roughly, what, 800 a year? Representing mm. a capital of about um, 40,000. I cannot imagine it is the capital you're intending to give away. Oh, yes, it is. Oh. But, good gracious, why not? I finish my life. What becomes of me doesn't matter. It does to me. I could hardly see you, for example, in the workhouse. Yes, I, I know what you mean, dear, because my name is the same as yours. Ah, the whole thing's preposterous. You can't do it. Oh, yes, I can. It's my money. Mark explained all about it. You still can't do it. Why? Wouldn't it be legal? Yes, damn it, it would be legal, but it's insane. And Mark must have been insane himself to leave such a will. Good heavens, to give all your money away without the slightest written obligation? Well, I said I might keep a hundred a year, and I shall live with Dora. Oh, yes, and that's another thing I thought of. This house. I was going to leave Humphrey 5,000. Now, of course, I shan't be able to. But if you like this house, Humphrey... I shan't give it to Tilly. I shall give it to you. Well, thank you very much, Aunt Isabel. There's nothing I'd like better. I'm so glad. Nonsense. He doesn't want the place. What did he do with it? Well, I should live in it, sir. Thought you were going back to New Zealand. I reckon not. Isabel, without prejudice, when do you intend to make Tilly cuff this absurd proposal? Well, as soon as she gets here, dear. Well, as soon as she's had dinner. What time is it? Isabel... Let me ask you one favour. Say nothing to Miss Cuff for at least a few days. Oh, but why, Simon? I want to get it over. Tilly will hardly be flattered to find her invitation merely a new way to pay old debts. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Yes. But I shouldn't have asked her, you know, if she hadn't been on my conscience. Are you sure? If you'd thought of her and guessed she needed a holiday? Well, I might have, dear. I hope I should. Then let Tilly Cuff come here for a pleasant vacation. My dear Isabel, when you tell Miss Cuff, as I know you are determined to do, of your really very reprehensible act, let there be a friendly atmosphere to soften the blow. Oh, I'm not thinking so much of yourself as of Tilly. Let her feel first that we were all well disposed to her. <laughs> the old fox. Very well, Simon, just to please you. Now, I really must go in, but you can stay here, all of you, ready to make Tilly welcome. I don't believe a word of it. I do. Well, at least it's an interesting situation. Even you do not seem wholly enthusiastic. As far as I can see, Miss Cuff simply lived on her rich relations. Pure parasite. Oh, I'm not blaming you. In 1913, I reckon there wasn't much else for her to do, but the fact remains she was a pure parasite. Are you a communist by any chance? <laughs> I don't know. I've certainly no use for the social system of 1913. It was the best system that ever existed. I look back to 1913 as the highest point of civilization from which we have been steadily retrogressing ever since. That's beside the point. The point we have to deal with is your aunt's extraordinary aberration. Well, why do you call it an aberration? Well, well, because the whole thing it plainly is. is. No, it isn't. I think myself, Mr. McGregor must have been a muff and Tilly a rabbit, but it was a tragedy for her all the same, and what Mrs. Brocken's trying to do now isn't crackers at all. She's going to tell, you know. She's going to tell Tilly Cuff what she did. Because you can't put everything right, that's no reason for not doing what you can. It's a matter of integrity. We seem to have landed in company beyond our moral station. Mm. Something should perhaps be done for Miss Cuff. Isabel might even make her a small allowance, but as for giving up her capital, it's insane. But Tilly wouldn't take it. Is she a high moral character, too? I don't know. I know practically nothing about her. She was a very quiet little thing, and very properly. But if Isabel puts such an opportunity in her way, the temptation will naturally be great. I bet the padre would have been pleased. Padre? What padre? Oh, the parson, sir, the bloke who preached. It can't be often that a sermon produces such a striking effect. Oh, very fortunately. Oh, but they should, you know. Personally, I think that's the most remarkable feature of the whole show, that Aunt Isabel went to church, heard what the parson told her, and then went home and did it. What are you grinning at? Well, it just struck me. Well? If you're still looking for the old-fashioned conscientiousness and the old-fashioned integrity, I reckon you found it. I, I think I heard the taxi. Oh, zero hour approaches. Tilly, here. Oh, oh, they're here. Oh, yeah. All these years. Isn't it a wonderful thing? 
morning, yes. Uh, here's Tilly. Here's Miss Cobb. Holy cow. Uh, uh, Tilly, uh, this is my nephew oh. Humphrey, <laughs> Ruth's boy, and Miss Brown, too, who, who helps us all. And Simon, who, of course, you know. Simon! Oh, after all these years! Oh, how perfectly ripping to see you. Yes, it's a great pleasure after, as you say, a, a long time. Oh, uh, and Ruth's boy. Oh, it doesn't seem possible, and yet I believe I should have known you. Oh, what a topper she was. And still is. Oh, to think I wasn't at her wedding. But there, that life, the best of friends must part. And is he sent me a piece of cake? It followed me half round Europe, and when it arrived, I thought it was insect powder. <laughs> but still, I was so glad to know I'd been remembered. Well, you, you, you travelled about so much. I was never very sure of your address. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'm quite a walking bedeker. That's one advantage of my chequered career. I suppose there isn't a good hotel in Switzerland where I haven't stayed at one time or another. If anyone here needs a first-rate courier, just apply to Little Tilly. <laughs> uh, a cigarette, Miss Cuff, or don't you smoke? Oh, yes, indeed, dear boy. I'd be lost without my fags. <laughs> oh, thank you. <clears throat> goody, goody. <clears throat> oh, yes, I, I've travelled all over Europe so lucky. Of course, some of my posts have been comparatively dull. Or oh, I dare say some people might find them so. <sighs> Personally, I'm never dull. So long as there's the least human interest, just one human being who needs my little mite of friendship, I am perfectly content. Uh, uh, I take such an interest in people. As Lady Plummer once said to me, it's the gloomy corners that need the ray of sunlight, dear Lady Plummer. I said, oh, this isn't a gloomy corner, and indeed it wasn't. Five servants, and she bore her asthma most gallantly. Uh, here, of course, I shall have no scope at all. <laughs> oh, it's such a cheerful house. <laughs> yes, wasn't it? Oh, what times we used to have, Issy, dear, you and Mark and Simon and I. <laughs> Oh, poor Mark. Oh, what a blow. Ah, oh, there, perhaps I may bring a little comfort. We must have long talks. <laughs> Your letter was a perfect godsend, dear. For so little I was with the feelings, dear Lady Plummer had written once again, would I go to Jamaica with her? Poor little Tilly didn't know what to do. <laughs> but Issy's letter cut the Gordian knot. My cousin needs me, I said. And after all, family ties come first. To Issy, I must go. <laughs> Is she coming in here? She's gone down the garden. Oh, look here, sir. You persuaded Aunt Isabel to wait, and she has waited. We've had two weeks of the woman. Hark! Oh, it's no one. We've no business in here, you know. The winter garden's supposed to be the pool's private stamping ground. I refuse to spend the entire weekend in my bedroom... Oh, Miss Brown, we shan't disturb you. I note it never strikes Miss Cuff to offer a little domestic assistance. Oh, I'm not overworked. Oh, Jackie likes work. She won't come to the flicks in case her brain isn't clear enough next morning to cook the inevitable kippers. I didn't want to see the film. Well, it was jolly good. Well, if you like idiotic musicals. I have a passion for them. Hmm. But then I'm just a rough, ignorant colonial. A point has just struck me. Do you realise that we are absolutely in the dark as to Miss Cuff's feelings for the chap? She may not have wanted to marry him. If that could be established, your aunt's whole preposterous scheme falls to the ground. Oh, well, personally, I live for the moment when Aunt Isabel is going to whip that letter out of her handbag and tell Tilly all. What? It's quite true. Mrs. Brocken thinks if she gave Tilly the letter to read, it would save a great deal of explanation. Good heavens. Personally, I'm all for it. If Aunt Isabel really means to pay Tilly off, the sooner she does it, the better. Because the woman is getting on all our nerves. The unfortunate pools are in a state of panic because she wants to send Greta to school. One moment. I'm just as eager as you are to get rid of Miss Cuff's company, but the idea of paying her off is extremely repugnant. I'm trusting that a fuller knowledge of Miss Cuff's character will convince my sister-in-law that magnanimity is out of place. Do you mean you hope Mrs. Brocken will get to hate her? I mean Mrs. Brocken will see through her. There have been no signs of it so far. Naturally. Your aunt has just achieved a remarkable feat. She put together an ill-judged phrase in a sermon and her own shabby treatment of Tilly Cuff and then took action. We cannot expect any further mental activity for some time. But what does it matter whether Mrs. Brocken sees through Miss Cuff or not? She's not going to give her money to Tilly because she likes her. Uh, I only hope no one is going to encourage Mrs. Brocken in her natural impulsiveness. If you mean me, I shan't mention the subject again. Oh, certainly not, sir. Jackie knows her place. 
Oh, for heaven's sake, stop behaving like a companion. Mm. Reverting to the pools. There is at least no reason why they should take alarm. Miss Cuff can't send the child to school against her will. You underrate their simplicity, sir. The pools don't reason, they just feel. Did you know Mrs. Poole had a husband? Oh, she told me she was a widow and I accepted the convention. I don't know now how Miss Cuff penetrated it. Rather cunningly, sir. She happened along when Jackie and I were washing up for the pools. Oh, Mrs. Poole, says Tilly. I've just seen your husband. And the fool of a woman said, where? It was a complete giveaway. Had Miss Cuff, in fact, seen him? No, she was being funny. At least that's what she said. Mrs. Poole just looks sick. And that's the woman you stick up for. I don't. It's the principal. Oh, you saw it yourself to begin with. Well, now I've seen Tilly Cuff, and in my opinion... Cooey! Got... Oh, take care. Oh. Cooey! <laughs> Isn't that what they say in Wagga Wagga? <laughs> I couldn't imagine where you'd all got to. No one in the drawing room, no one on the terrace. I cooeyed all down the garden. Oh, I hope you weren't hiding from me. I had, in fact, just inquired your whereabouts. This is where I always do odd jobs. Oh, busy hands, never idle. But doesn't someone want to help you? I'm sure he does. Oh, this won't take long. Nonsense, Humphrey. Come and do your good deed for the day. <sighs> oh, Simon, I'm sure you're not comfortable. Why don't we old folk go out on the terrace? Thank you. I prefer to remain where I am. Then I'll keep you company. <sighs> Lackaday, what a change, what a change. This place used to be so full of blues, we called it our little fairyland, didn't we, old fellow? Oh. And now there are only greeters geraniums. It is rather sad. It's probably lousy with earwigs. You know, Simon, I've been wanting to say this ever since I came. It's your being here makes this house seem really like home to me. Is the bower extinct? It's a myth. Ah, uh, this crossword chap's getting inaccurate. You do too many of those crosswords, Simon. You'll try your eyes. Oh, so this is where you've all got to. Daughter's coming to dinner. She just telephoned to ask if we could have her, and I said, of course, it's Mrs. Poole's night out. Now, isn't that nice? Well, I'll be delighted to see the old battle egg. Yes, and so will Tilly. Well, Tilly's hardly seen her. Well, my dears, to be frank, I think Dora's avoiding me. Oh, poor Dora was always a little jealous... And now she sees how very much better I've worn than she has. Oh, well, uh, perhaps it's only natural. I hope there's enough. Oh, my dear, Stu always goes round. Now, whatever are you all in here? It's not a bit comfortable. Simon and I are reviving old memories, flowers and lights and music. Yes, didn't it look pretty when we gave a dance? And what ripping little hops they wear. Do you remember sitting out on the stairs, Simon, eating ices? No. Oh, it was topping. And there were all sorts of rules. On the first flight, it was quite proper, and on the second, as far as the turn. But after the turn, where one couldn't be seen from below, it was rather fast. <laughs> what dear little innocents we were. Where did you and Mama sit, Aunt Isabel? Above or below? Oh, below, of course, dear. Well, we were hostesses. Of course, we three were always in full view and very decorative, too. We were known as the Three Graces. Don't mm. you remember, Isabel, at that last dance before I went to Switzerland? We were standing under the chandelier waiting for our guests when the band leader suddenly raised his glass to us to the Three Graces. Yes, I dare see he did, dear. I know Papa always gave him a glass of wine before he started. I remember that dance very well. Mark and I brought a friend with us, a man called McGregor. McGregor? Oh, I don't remember him. Ah. Uh, S Switzerland must be heaven. Did you ski? My dear companions don't ski. Mrs. Williamson never let me out of her sight. She went to Switzerland to die, you know, or didn't you know? I dare say not. I was rather young for the responsibility, but she died in 1915. And fortunately, I got a post as governess in Bern. Uh, they were short of English governesses just then. Yes, I know you got about a good deal. Next, I went to Paris. La Ville Lumière. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I taught English, music and elocution to the three daughters of a professor of geology in the Rue Vaugirard. Your mother would have been quite pleased, Isabel. We were so respectable. When the last of them married, I came home. I should have thought that an English woman with your abilities would have found more scope abroad. Odd as it may seem, I wanted to come home. 
Even governesses share some of the normal emotions. I'd been away nearly 15 years, so I came uh, home and found governesses were quite gone out. The families who could have afforded them sent their daughters to boarding school instead. Well, I suppose it made for quiet in the home. But there were always the sick and the elderly and the people their relatives didn't want. <laughs> so I made a new niche for myself. Tilly! Isabel! I... Oh, Jackie looks quite upset. But I assure you, dear, a companion's life has many compensations. One always feels needed. What would Issy do without you? Oh, and I'm sure, Jackie, you're very lucky to have found such a good post. When I take wing again... Put it away. I only hope I may be as fortunate. She doesn't remember him. But of course she says she doesn't. But what? Oh, of course, I'm not so young as I used to be, but so long as one doesn't look more than 30... Uh, People don't ask, so I mean to stay 30 for years. <laughs> Tilly, this letter. <laughs> oh, 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 no, I am sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mean as expected. Oh, I'm sorry, Aunt Isabel. I am a clumsy clot. Really? What carelessness. Oh, what a mess. Well, I'll sweep it up. Poor Greta. It's her geranium. I can't think why you allow the pools to use this place at all. Surely the kitchen's enough for them. There, of course, they make one feel an absolute intruder. Whenever I go in, I notice it. Then please don't go in, Tilly. I never do myself, and I'm sure I ask you not to either, because the pools like to be left alone. Well, I find it difficult to neglect an obvious duty. Oh. What's that? My dear Isabel, I know I'm no one here, but I can't see you neglecting an obvious duty without speaking of it. That child's being ruined. She's as ignorant as a little savage. Another year at school, preferably boarding school, might be the saving of her. It wouldn't cost so much. Well, I'm not thinking of the money. I'm thinking of Mrs. Poole, who wants Greta with her. Exactly. Mothers of that class always are possessive. I dare say Greta's father would take a longer view. Well, I don't want to discuss it now. Uh, Jackie, mm -hmm. if there are any more beans, I think we'd better pick them. Dora, you know. Well, there aren't, but there are lettuces. I could make a salad. Uh, Humphrey, dear, will you go down to the garden and cut any lettuces that are nice? The meat's going to be a little short. It always is. Well, I haven't noticed Well, it. you wouldn't, dear boy, for the simple reason that Isabel always gives you twice your share. Oh, Tilly, And I, I must don't... say, while we're on the subject, it's your own fault, is he? The butcher here has known you for years. Don't tell me he can't slip you an extra ration. Oh, but I've never asked him to. I, I don't ask him, Tilly. Well, everyone else does. We get enough to eat. Only just. And don't start talking to me about Germany, because what I say is, who won the war? We won it. Well, it doesn't seem like it. It certainly doesn't seem like it the way we live. If we hadn't won it, I reckon I shouldn't be here. I should be either dead or slave labour. So would Jackie. Aunt Isabel would die of starvation, and Uncle Simon would undoubtedly get himself shot. So we, even living as we are, rightly prefer to have won. But, of course, I can't judge for you. Humphrey, Humphrey, oh, dear. Oh, I don't mind. I ask no apology. Everyone knew the army wasted half its rations. We did not. Quite possibly, I'm sorry, dear. but in our unit... Women are always more conscientious. But we all know what the men did. Drew extra rations and then kept pigs. I'm going back to my office. But, Simon, dear, it's Saturday night. I shall sleep on two chairs and dine at the club. Can you give me a shakedown on the floor, sir? Humphrey, now that I will not have with Dora coming to dinner, don't be so silly. I'm sorry. Well, come on, Jackie, leave those beans and help me forage. I've got to finish these, then I must change. OK. Simon, I'm sorry you've been interrupted in your crossword, but please don't talk of going. I hope I may not be compelled to such a cause. Oh, dear. Now you're going to shut himself in the bathroom and I shan't be able to speak to him. Simon! What do you want to say? Oh, nothing in particular, dear. It is Simon! Well, what a storm in a teacup. I've never known such a house for bickering. We used not to bicker. Oh, at least you and I are pals, aren't we, dear? I hope you were right not to go when Humphrey asked you. Good heavens, he can cut a lettuce by himself. You know what I mean, dear? You didn't go to the cinema last night, either. Miss Cuff, I'd really rather not talk about it, because there's nothing to talk about. I didn't go to the cinema because I didn't want to see the oh, film. very well, dear, very well. You mustn't be offended. Uh, I'm not offended. I naturally take an interest in you because, well, you and I are very much in the same boat. Oh, oh really? Oh, I don't say that Isabel treats you badly, though, of course, you're shockingly overworked. I don't think so. 
The six weeks I've been here are... were the happiest I've ever had. Six weeks? Oh, six weeks! My dear, I liked this place too when I first came here. My word, I thought I'd fallen on my feet. But it's wonderful how people change once they've got used to you. Hmm. I used to do that too. I wasn't supposed to. I wasn't supposed to help in the kitchen, but... It was wonderful what little duties came my way. Slice the beans, shell the peas. Shelling peas is rather a nice job. Yes, that's what they used to say. Such a nice little job. Let's all do it together. And then we'd just get started when someone would come for Miss Ruth and Miss Isabel was wanted to go calling and I'd be left to finish alone. Do you wash the dog, dear? I have done. Hmm, so did I, and a messy business it was. But it isn't our dog, he's... Isabel's. Why shouldn't she wash him herself? Mrs. Brocken pays me, you know. That's right, dear, that's right. Always remember that. Don't make the mistake I did and think it's being put down to your good nature. Her companion can't be considered good-natured because whatever she does, her employer regards it as paid for. At 30 pounds a year. Is that all? Oh, my dear, it's, it's very rarely that I've accepted 30. <clears throat> It's the tipping that's so tiresome. In hotels, you know. The waiters look at one. It's so unfair. Other women get away with five shillings when it ought at least to be ten. Simply because they're Mrs. This or Lady That and everyone knows who they are. Yes, you're young and pretty. It's when you get older you need... You so desperately need someone who knows you. And that's why you should be so careful never to miss your chance. I believe you ought at least to have gone to the cinema with him. A week ago, you were warning me not to make myself cheap. I know, dear, I know. Because though a young man may amuse himself, a companion may not. It's the fatal mistake. But I'll tell you what I think now. <clears throat> Isabel is so simple-minded. I believe that if Humphrey really engaged one of her companion's affections, Isabel would take the girl's part. Oh. I, I don't believe she'd make any objections to their marrying. And that's important because it's Isabel who has the money. And his people are too far off to interfere. You might quite well catch him. Miss Cuff, I've said before, there's no question. Nonsense, child. You needn't pretend with me. I know a girl's got to be careful. She can't afford to take risks because naturally, well, if a young man goes to his people and says he's going to marry a girl no one's heard of, a, a girl without a penny, well, well, naturally they won't be pleased. Really? And even if um, there's a very strong reason, they'll try to get him out of it. But Isabel's such a fool. There, that's done. I believe you're blushing. I'm going to change now. Has he, um, has he ever asked you to kiss him? Miss Cuff, will you mind your own business? Well, I was... I have here... Oh, where's Mrs. Brocken? She's looking for you. She thought you'd be in the bathroom. Well, I was not. I was in the cellar. We have here a Latour and a Beaujolais. Oh. You give me a cup of decanters, I'll see if they're still drinkable. Why, inside the dear, things are looking up. Well, I shall change to either little black number, as the girls say, rather beguily. <laughs> Toodle-doo! <gasps> toodle oh. That's the creature. That's the woman to whom my sister-in-law proposed to make over a fortune. However... I think we see daylight. Oh, Mr. Brocken, isn't it dreadful when dreadful people tell you the truth? What? Uh, I may need a piece of clean linen. Well, what may be the truth? Only, how can one tell? Uh, oh, I I'm sorry, what did you say? I was asking for a piece of clean linen. However, oh, never mind, my, my handkerchief may serve. Uh, the glasses are all over there. I if you'll tell me which ones, when I come down, I'll put them on the table. Well, Greta, what do you want? Would you like to see something? No. Oh, come on. I've got a surprise for you. Miss Brown's seen her, but no one else has. Mum! Come in, Mum! Where are you, love? In here. It's all right. It's only him. There. Oh. Don't she look smashing? <laughs> Mr. Brocken don't know me. Oh, to be frank, I did not. 
Great Scott. I did want you to see her in evening dress. She's going dancing at the pally with her friend. Don't she look smashing? Uh, smashing indeed. It was Greta made it for me. She's ever so handy with her needle. Yeah, you know what I think? I think Mum ought to be on the movies. Uh, I no doubt she would have been a great success. However, her present occupation is perhaps less hazardous. Your mother's quite happy where she is. Eh, Mrs. Poole? I don't know. We was happy. We've liked it here ever so, haven't we, love? Mm. Especially before they all came. Well, when the house was empty, you naturally had less work. But you still receive every consideration. Well, what's that Miss Cuff want to send Greta to school for? Good heavens, I've no idea. In any case, she can't, so don't worry. She said there was an act about it. The act Miss Cuff referred to is the Education Act, not yet in force. It won't touch Greta, which is probably a pity. If you were both of you better educated, you might at least understand the laws of your own land. We don't want nothing to do with the law at all. It's better to keep clear of it. My good woman, the law is to protect you and guide you. It's nothing to be afraid of. Well, Greta isn't afraid of policemen. No. I was when I was a kiddie, but Greta's not. She asks them the way and everything. Yeah, I ask them the time. If you want to know the time, ask a policeman. <laughs> if, if you, you want, want to know, know the time, time ask a policeman. Doesn't sing nice, eh? along with you. <laughs> you see, Greta and me... Well, you might say we're all in all to each other. That's right. All we want is to be left in peace. The universal human desire, the pathetic human hope. Don't worry, Mrs. Poole. Greet us in no danger. Just put the whole thing out of your mind. Thank you, sir. There, ma'am. Here, if you want to see a smashing car, just nip out before your dinner and look by the back gates. My friend's in the business. I'll be back before 12 and Greta's got her books. i got film frolic and film fancies and film photo and a bag of all sorts. Oh, oh boy! Oh, good night, sir. <laughs> good night. Good night, sleep tight. Don't let... Greta, oh. <laughs> carry those beans in for Miss Brown. Right, And you might put them on while you're about it. Oh, oh really? Simon, are you playing hide-and-seek with me? I thought you were upstairs. No, I've been in the cellar. Simon, I must talk to you. You asked me to wait, and I've waited. But I think it's been long enough. Well? You know, I thought and thought. I can't have everything being so mixed up. If only I could get to know Tilly again. I mean, if only we understood her better. I can't believe she's as bad as you make out. She's already destroyed the comfort of this household. Why are we assembled now in this dilapidated tool shed? Well, if Tilly thought you all extremely rude dodging her, so I really couldn't blame Not a question of manners. It's a question of self-preservation. Oh, well, I don't understand you. I really don't. I think we'd better not talk about it anymore. All right, I'll deal with the wine tomorrow. Oh, dear. Oh, my, my dearest Miss Cuff. Your modesty and shyness make it difficult to speak to you, especially among so many people. I will at once speak to Mr. Massey. If not, you need not fear I shall trouble you again. Believe me, dearest Miss Cuff, your devoted Ian McGregor. Oh, dear. Voila! <laughs> Chilly! That drift. French, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Plummer, much too young for her, but I think it suits me. Oh, you look beautiful. Oh, oh Tilly, dear, what a long time it is since we were young. Well, there is a difference in our ages, you know. And I didn't often outshine you, did I, Isabel? Dora won't be here just yet, so let's sit for a few minutes and be comfortable together. Certainly. <clears throat> Tilly. I've been very selfish. Is that why you asked me to stay here? Because I was on your conscience? Oh, no, no, of course not. I just thought it would be nice to see you again. At least... I wondered when I got your letter. First, I thought you couldn't get any help. Then when I came here and found Jackie in the pools, I wondered again. However, I'm glad you just thought it would be nice to see me. Is it? Well, I'm sure it would be if, if we could find each other again. You see, you've changed so, Tilly. I suppose I have two, but we seem almost like strangers. I feel we've got to know each other all over again. Oh, you've had an easy life and I've had a hard one. Yes, dear, I know that, but I don't think it ought to make you hate me. My dear Issy, of course I don't hate you. I don't hate anyone. You mean companions can't afford to? Oh, dear. I owe your family a deep debt of gratitude and I never forget favours. 
Has anyone been saying things behind my back? Oh, no, of course not. Why, who would? Well, I thought Jackie might have said something. Or Simon. You don't know the slyness and jealousy one has to guard against. If anyone here says they've heard me utter a word against you, they're not speaking the truth. But tinny, tinny, no one has. We're, well, I'm your friend. Well, we used to get on so well together. We used to have such a good time, didn't we? Surely you haven't forgotten everything. Your mother was good to me. Yes, I wondered how much she remembered her. I remember when she came to fetch me from Bournemouth. She was wearing a sealskin jacket. I'd never seen one before. Not to touch. I've still got it. No. She gave it to me when I got the moth. Of course, it isn't worth anything. Do you know there are still some things of hers in a box upstairs? We could go through them together. I hadn't realised that you were so fond of her, Tilly. She came the day after the funeral. I was sitting in the basement. All the other rooms were let, and I hadn't a right to be there even because we owed the landlord rent. Oh. Your mother drove up in a cab. Oh, my dear, how dreadful it must have been for you. I was 16. It was dreadful. And then you came here and made your home with us. Oh, how right Mama was to bring you. She said, you're to come and be our little cousin. I thought she was an angel. Oh, I'm so glad you've told me. It makes me able to, well, to recognize you again. I knew I was right. Only I'm so used to be guided by Simon. Tilly, do you think I'm a fool? Oh, certainly not, dear. But if you want my advice, go on letting Simon guide you. Oh, dear. Oh, oh dear, Tilly. I said, really, that's very funny. I shall tell Simon what you said. Oh, dear. Well, I'm glad I made a joke. Personally, I don't see it. Well, you will soon. Oh, dear. Oh, yes, you always laughed easily. Well, it's one way of attracting the men. Well, there are other ways, too, Tilly, by being quiet and modest and unassuming. That's what some men look for and fall in love with. I brought up Till... a bottle of sherry. Oh, good, dear. Look at Tilly's dress. I can't take my eyes off it. Chic, eh? Smashing. <laughs> uh, where's Dora? She isn't here yet. Tilly, why don't you go and look out for her? Certainly, dear. Humphrey. I must ask you to behave more nicely to Dilly. It's no good saying smashing if you make it sound like a swear word. I had no idea my elocution was so good. Tilly is far more sensitive than you think. We've just had a really nice talk. Yes, I reckon she'd been bamboozling you. Ah, oh, Isabel, for heaven's sake, I don't want to be awkward. I just don't want to see you get hurt. But oh, gracious me, Tilly won't hurt me. But why should she want to when I'm going to give her so much? If you let an animal out of a trap, it oughtn't to want to bite you. But sometimes it does. Oh, my dear boy. Yes, Dora. Ah, good evening, Isabel. And what are you all doing in here? Dora, I'm sure I don't know. Uh, next week you'll probably find us in the attics. Well, you won't find me in the attics. You'll find me in the cellar. Sherry, Dora? Eh, hey, thank you, I will. But where's Tilly? She went out to meet you, wasn't she, on the terrace? Uh, no, not when I came up. Sorry I'm late. Oh, hello, Mr. Maine. Good evening, my dear. Oh, you look a bit peaky. Is Isabel overworking you? <laughs> no, of course not. Come in for one of our Ted Bob facials. But I wonder where Tilly is. I do you hope she didn't go round to the kitchen. My dear Isabel, since we are for once free of the woman's presence, let us make the most of the respite. Here, here. And give Miss Brown a sherry. Dear me, I remember sitting out here at your dances. Isabel was a very good hostess. She always saw I had partners. It wasn't easy, was it, dear? Oh, I don't know. Now, my poor mother believed in girls looking girlish, with the result that I looked like a giraffe tied up in pink ribbons. And Simon used to look like a mute at a first-class funeral. Oh. Would you be 20 again, Simon? Certainly not. No, uh, nor would I. These youngsters must think we're mad. I don't. One can make such a fool of oneself when one's young. How right you are, darling. I'd be young again. Oh, how nice it is to sit quietly and talk over old times. Sometimes there'd be eight or nine of us out and we used to meet at the pond. You're what was that? It sounds you're like Tilly again. again. Tilly, you're trying to get to the bottom of it. Isabel, Isabel, will you kindly see if you can get this child to answer you? There's something very wrong going on in this house and I mean to get to the bottom of it. Oh, whatever's the matter? I have just seen a woman, a woman in the most flashy evening dress, going out of the back gate with a man. Well, I naturally ran round to the kitchen to question Mrs. Poole. Mrs. Poole isn't there, and Greta here appears to be struck down. I don't suppose she knows anything about oh, it. Oh, yes, she does. It was probably Mrs. Poole you saw. Well, don't you speak to me. And why should Mrs. Poole be in evening dress? To go dancing at the uh, Palais. 
And what's wrong with that? If there's nothing wrong about it, why didn't you tell me yourself? Greta doesn't like being shouted at, and it's Mrs. Poole's evening out. Well, you all seem to be a great deal better informed than I am, and I must say that Come I'm not... Come here, the... Greta. I have no doubt it was your mother, and that she was accompanied as usual by her friend. And I have no doubt she looks extremely well, and is going to have a very pleasant evening. Now run back to your play, and don't be alarmed. She said... Mum looked like a bad lot. Oh, my dear, I'm sure she did. Yes, she did, and it's not right to say it about my mum. Now, don't you see, child, Miss Cuff didn't know it was your mother. My mum's lovely, and I'm not going to let any old cow go over there. Oh, oh now, come mom. along, Greta, and help me to get dinner. Come along. Oh. If you mix the salad, you can have oh. a hard boiled oh, egg. Right. Come on. Uh, Humphrey, dear, give Tilly a sherry. Tilly. Well, I yes. must say, you all take it very calmly. How long has this sort of thing been going on? Oh, don't you know? Dressing up and going dancing, bringing strange men into the house. Mrs. Poole brings no strange men into the house. How do you know? From my reading of the woman's character. Do you imagine I should allow my sister-in-law to employ in a position of trust a woman in whom I had not confidence? Are you implying that I abuse her reliance on my judgment? You had better control your tongue. Oh, uh, uh, of course. Uh, of course, Simon. Uh, you know best. Yes. Sherry? Oh, oh, thank you. I'm pretty late. Here's Dora. Oh, uh, oh, good evening, Dora. Uh, it, was, it was such a shock and, and, and a surprise seeing that, that flashy dress. I'm afraid I made a naughty mistake. <laughs> oh, I did put my foot in it, didn't I? Yes. <clears throat> well... Tilly, how do the haunts of your youth look to you now? Oh, uh, oh, everything's much the same. Oh, surely, Isabel, surely you must realise now that something should be done about Greta. What ideas can she be getting? What example? At least has it'll she? be no good to bully her. I bully? The kid was scared out of a year's growth. That's right, that's right. Take her part, take her part against me. We all do. Why, even Jackie, Miss Brown, Isabel's companion, thinks she can speak to me just as she pleases. Well, why can't you mind your own business? There you are. Mind your own business again, from a mere boy. Oh, I'm no one here. Speak to me as you like. Tilly, 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 That's right, everyone against me. Dora here talks about the haunts of my youth. Well, I begin to wish I'd never come back to them. No one wants me here. Now, now, Tilly, you know that's not true. And it's not very nice when Dora's been invited to dinner. Dora must think she's been invited to a free-for-all. I'll join you for grub. Oh, don't mind me. I can stand a great deal of excitement. What's happened to Bogey? He's generally in my lap by this time. Oh, Bogey is still at the vets. It's his ears and his paws, you see. Yeah, that animal ought to be shot. <laughs> Why? Because he's too old. He's a nuisance to himself and everyone else. I see, because he's old and worn out. He can't help growing old, but all the same, he's abused for it. But well, dogs can't die when they want to, you know, any more than people can. I dare say you think old people ought to be shot too. Tilly, Tilly, please. I dare say you think I'd better be out of the way. That's it, isn't it? I'm old and wearing out and no one, no one in the world. God wants me or cares for me or cares what's to become of me. I ought to be shot. Tilly, Tilly, please, dear. I care for you. Well, we all care for you. Right. It's true that I care. And when you hear what I'm going to tell you, you'll believe me. Must you, Isabel? Yes, I must. Listen to me, Tilly. Tilly, when Simon asked you this evening if you remembered Mr. McGregor... There was a reason for it. I put the plain question and Miss Cuff gave us a plain answer. She hasn't the least recollection of it. Yes, I have. You see, of course she has. <laughs> when he came to a, to a dance here, he, he came with you and Mark. Information I gave you myself. Well, I remember too. Then why didn't you say so at the time? I told you why. I understood, Tilly. I knew that you didn't want to talk about him. I feel just the same about Mark. And I dare say some people think I've forgotten him. Oh, and Mr. McGregor was so handsome. He, he was so tall. Oh, I don't think I'd have called him tall. Well, he was tall compared with me. About five foot eight. You see? Even Dora remembers him. I don't see why you should say even Dora. I may have been plain, but I wasn't blind. He had a Scottish accent. The name McGregor almost postulates one. Oh, Tilly, Tilly, I'm so glad you remember him so well. And half sorry, because... Oh, dear. If only you hadn't been so shy. Read that. Isabel, don't you see? Tilly, read that. He wanted to marry me. Yes. He says... He says... Why didn't I get it? I was down that morning early. I found it in the box and read it. <gasps> 
I didn't believe it. I thought perhaps Mark and Simon were playing some cruel joke. You did not. You've acknowledged to me. Very well. I disbelieved it because I wanted to. Because just then, for those few days, I was in love with him myself. So I just took it upstairs. You wanted to marry me and you took it. You were as good as engaged to Mark already. I wasn't, oh, Tilly, Tilly. Where is he now? We don't know. He may have married someone else. He may even be alive. We don't know. But that's all in the past, Tilly. It's all over. I had to tell you because it's the reason for what I'm going to do now. I spoiled your life. Yes, you spoiled it. You ruined it. Oh, what I think. What I think. All I can do now is nothing, I know. But at least I can make you independent. I can give you all my money. And if you ask why I waited so long, all I can say is it wasn't until I heard that sermon that I realized my wickedness. Wicked. Wicked, wicked. And now I'm going to try to make amends, as the sermon said. I'm going to give you all my money, wicked, Tilly. Wicked, I, I'll never forgive you, never. Yes, 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 I know I was wicked. I've admitted it. But now I'm doing all I can. Oh, Tilly, where are you going? Oh, here, oh, here, my darling. No, 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 stop oh, it. Now you see, Simon, you see what I did. Oh, let her be. Dora, can't you see? Yes, I think so. Go after her, Isabel. Oh, if only she'd let me explain. Simon, you said it was over and done with and that there were no consequences. Well, just look at Tilly now. And I've lived all these years so happily. Oh, Tilly, Tilly. Humphrey, it is now a quarter to ten. Oh, it's not bad for a Sunday morning, sir. I was up at seven. Why can't you eat your breakfast indoors like a Christian? Perhaps I'm not a Christian. Rubbish. I distinctly remember your aunt sending you a christening mug. Oh, good morning. Oh, Miss Brown. Have you seen my sister-in-law this morning? Yes, I took her tray up. Miss Cuff was asleep, so I brought hers down again. I heard them talking in the night. Well, I went along the corridor. It must have been nearly three. I thought Mrs. Brocken might like some tea, but... She was in there with Miss Cuff, talking, talking, and sobbing, you know, for ages. Oh, Lord. So I just went back to bed. Well, let us hang our heads. Uh, while you and I slept the sleep of the just, or at any rate of the hard, and poor Jackie was standing with her feet cold, ready to do the ministering angel. Personally, I slept little. Where are the newspapers? They're late on Sundays. Usually we go for them. It's only at the corner. Oh, then I'll go for them myself. Oh, we're in for a gay Sunday. I think it will be gay, if Tilly takes the money. What? Well, don't you see? It releases us. Why have we all stayed here these last miserable days? Because we've been obliged to stay by Mrs. Brocken's obligation to Miss Cuff. Well, we could hardly have whistled off and left it. No. But if Tilly takes the money, the obligation's broken. Mrs. Brocken goes to live with Dora, and we're free to go where we please. Jackie? Well? Wasn't Tilly rather snappish with you last night? In the row, I've agreed to. Don't you speak to me, something like that. Did you notice? I always notice what anyone says to you. I'd been rude to her. Oh, good. Why? She'd been giving me advice. Well, it doesn't matter. Sometimes people do mean to be kind. As soon as I see her, I'll apologize. Oh, come off it, darling. Oh, don't call me darling in that silly way. It's, it's humiliating. I didn't mean to humiliate you. No, of course not. You don't mean anything. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm behaving like an idiot. Yes, I reckon you are. You've let that woman get under your skin, and I'm surprised you haven't more sense. And the sooner we both get away from here, the better. I don't know where to go. Well, maybe your people will want you at home a bit first. Jackie. Yes? Look, perhaps I've been a bit of an idiot too, but... Uh, at first, I didn't want to rush things, and then you riled me and... Well, it was nice falling in love sedately, wasn't it? It was sweet. Well, the first week or two here, when you were still shy and good as gold, and so was I. Oh, heck, it didn't seem possible after all the tough times we'd been through. I just wanted it to last. So did I. It was like the Garden of Eden. I was afraid, even when I heard Mr. Brocken was coming. Simple, weren't we? He wouldn't have hurt us. No. 
Other than the first thing that Tilly would, and then to see her actually getting hold of you and trying to worm her own twisted little thoughts into your mind oh. and making a jolly good start at it. I think she must be the original serpent. I ought to have my ears boxed for listening to her. Good. If necessary, I'll box them. Is that clear? <laughs> yes, Humphrey. I shall also make all future arrangements for your welfare. Oh. You're not to do anything without telling me. In fact, from now on, regard yourself as my responsibility. Yes, Humphrey. Now may I call you, darling? Oh, yes, Humphrey. I met the paper boy on his round. You certainly lightened his load, sir. I fear of a purely material burden. Well, Jackie and I have been discussing things, and we're both agreed that when Tilly takes the money, it's the best all round. Oh, have you? Well, I don't agree with you. Has your aunt made her appearance? Oh, no. And the whole situation may yet be saved. Uh, please, could I have a word with you? Oh, certainly, Greta. Uh, in, in private. <clears throat> Humphrey... Help me get lunch. Oh, right. Now, child, if you're worrying about Miss Cuff's interference in your affairs, remember that it is quite unjustified. You're not forced to take her advice, and no one can make you. No, it's not about school. That They could send me, but I'd run away. No, it, it, it's about the other thing. She's going to find me dad. Nonsense. It isn't nonsense to Mum and me. It's awful. I beg your pardon when I say nonsense. I mean, it is nonsensical of Miss Cuff to take up such a position. How can she find your father? Well, she said if a man's been in the forces, you can just, uh, just track him down. My child, is it after all such a trouble to you to think of finding your father? Yes. Oh, I can hardly believe well, that. Well, you didn't know him. He used to shout at us. He used to come in at night and throw things about and shout at us for hours and hours. And sometimes he socked my mum. She never let him lay a finger on me. She, she used to put me in the cupboard, but I heard. Good heavens. So he ran away. One morning, while he was still sleeping it off, Mum packed all her things. She got a job in a cafe, and we had a room over the newspaper shop, but Mum was on her feet all day, and, well, of course, she didn't see much of me. And, and then you come looking for a caretaker, and the newspaper man told us, and when Mum came back from seeing you, she said, Peter, I believe our trouble's over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear child. We, we had the house and the garden and no one to shout at us. It was what was like being in heaven. Oh, well, this is lousy for you, isn't it? It's not your funeral, but, but I've got to talk to someone. What I want to know is why can't she leave us alone? What have we done to her? Miss Cuff believes school would be a good thing for you. And as your mother doesn't agree, she feels your father should be consulted. But Mum's done everything for me. She got me my orange juice and, and, and cod liver oil and, and everything. Why should my dad ever say so? Well, because in the eyes of the law, his is the legal right. Does that mean because Mum married him? Exactly. That makes him your legal guardian. So that if Mum hadn't married him, we, we'd be OK? Oh, my dear child, if your mother hadn't married your father, you wouldn't be here. It's because I was on the way she did it, so I wouldn't be a little basket. Oh, she'd do anything for me, Mum would. Oh, if we'd only known. Rita, there you are. I told her not to come bothering you, sir. Oh, it's all right. He doesn't mind. He's not angry with us. Now, sit down, Mrs. Bull. Now, I've been trying to relieve Greta's anxieties. Oh, I know you're kind. But what can you do? Well, I suppose this is it. I might have known it was too good to last. We dodged the bombs all right, but... This is it. Oh, cheer up, Mum. Oh, how can I cheer up when it's all going to begin again? She won't let it rest. I can see that. She wrote letters to the IOPS. <clears throat> Mrs. Poole, has it struck you that your husband may be dead? If he were in the forces, as is extremely probable, you may be entitled to a pension. We don't want his pension. We just don't want anything to do with him. He'd have had Greeter in a box factory at 14... But we've got it all planned. She's going to be an apprentice at Madame Esme's. That's right. I'm going to be a beautician. They get good money and it's nice work. And there's that Miss Tremaine there who'll keep an eye on her. If it hadn't been for that all planned, we'd have done a bunk long since. Oh, I can see you mean well, sir, but you just don't understand. If Jim's dead, I'd be easier for knowing it. But I won't take any risk. You've been very kind... And I'm sorry Greta's troubled you, because what can you do? Come along, love. Come along. Okay. Mrs. Poole. It's no use, sir. If the worst come to the worst, well, we'll just run for it again. No, thank you, Jackie, dear. I don't want any coffee. I've had a very nice breakfast. 
Simon. Well? Oh, I'm so glad to see you all again. Oh, Jackie, uh, what became of Dora? She ate her dinner and went home. Well, has Miss Cuff recovered her senses? Oh, yes, she's much quieter. Oh, dear, I had to tell her all over again. Oh, how dreadful. And it was. My dear Isabel, I'm sure we all sympathise with you. The point is, how did Miss Cuff take it? Dreadfully. She was passionately in love with Ian McGregor. Do you know, I never realised until now that we'd been so cruel to her. Nonsense. No one was cruel well, to I'm her. Well, I'm sure we didn't think we were. We thought she was treated just like one of ourselves. But she wasn't, you know. She only had one new evening dress the time she was with us. And that only cost four pounds. Did she sob that out last night? At least she must appreciate your thoroughgoing desire to make amends. Eight hundred a year. Did you tell her you proposed to consult her with eight hundred a year? Yes, but... Uh, but, but what? She doesn't believe you'll let me do it. Ah, then there's your loophole. Leave it to me. I'll deal with her. No. Then you're a fool. Well, I know you've always thought me one, Simon, but I can only do what I believe right. And now, good gracious me, it's a lovely morning. Why do we all sit here looking so solemn? Because we feel solemn. Well, I don't. I feel rather tired, but I don't feel solemn in the least. But this afternoon, I shall go and see Dora. I'm going to enjoy living with Dora. I'm going to be very happy. I think you are, too. And I think you're absolutely heroic. Oh, my dear. <laughs> no, there are some things I must do. Heroic. <laughs> I'm going to read the papers. Humphrey, come here a minute, dear. Now that you and Jackie have stopped quarrelling... Jackie and I have never quarrelled. Oh, that's nonsense, dear, but never mind. I must ask, because if you and she have any plans, I needn't give Jackie notice. But otherwise I must, because, of course, I shan't need a companion anymore. Oh, dear me. What I really mean is, do you want to marry Jackie? Yes, Aunt Isabel, oh, I do. Oh, my dear boy, I'm so delighted. I really am. Have you asked her? I've told her. Oh, that's so much better. I never thought you'd have the sense. Simon! Come out, dear. You needn't be tactful anymore. I wasn't being tactful. I wanted to read the papers. What is it? Everything's all right between Jackie and Humphrey. They're going to be married now. Isn't that nice? I will spare you, sir, the effort of being congratulatory. Oh, I am so pleased. And really, I had nothing whatever to do with it. I just used to say a little prayer each night. And even then I wasn't sure I'd got the right saint. Simon, there's something... I want to say to you that I couldn't before the others, and it's about you and me and and Mark. We both loved Mark very much. You think he'd disapprove of what I'm going to do for Tilly. I know he'd say I was right, and it's no good arguing about it anymore. But he wouldn't like us not to be friends. Don't be angry with me, Simon. If I have deserved such a rebuke, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my oh. dear. Thank you, Simon. You don't believe I love you, but you'd be surprised how much I do. Good morning. Tilly. Oh, my dear. Have you had any breakfast? I found some cold coffee in your room. I drank it. Oh, well, then now come and sit down because Simon wants to speak to you. <laughs> oh, he does, does he? I wondered what you were cooking up. My sister-in-law wishes me to state formally... State formally. You can't take me in by fine words. Isabel pretends she wants to give me all her money, but she gets you here to see that she doesn't do it. I suppose you'll offer me 50 pounds to forgive her and clear out. Well, I don't think it's enough. Tilly, ah. Tilly, now listen to me. Mm. I did you a great wrong oh. when we were both girls together and I had every advantage. I did you a great wrong, but I'm going to make amends. You're going to be independent. I don't believe you. Simon, make her. My sister-in-law is speaking the truth. She intends, from motives with which I may say I do not sympathize, to make you a present of some 30,000 pounds. But she can do it. She can give me all her money? Yes. And you won't stop her? It's not within my power. And Isabel really means to do it? Yes, and let me say here and now, for it should be said that I consider her behaviour quixotic to the point of insanity. If I had the power to stop her, I would. Does that reassure you? 
I don't consider you worthy of such generosity. It was an unlucky day for all of us when Mrs. Massey brought you into this house. I don't for oh, one moment... Simon, No, no, stop. no, let me finish. It's time someone spoke out. So I don't for one moment believe that you were ever in love with McGregor or that your heart was broken or any of the rest of it. I believe you are taking advantage of Isabel's simplicity. You'll beggar her and laugh at her. But she can do what she likes with her own property and I can't stop her. Now will you have the decency to admit that my sister-in-law is speaking the truth when she offers you the money? I don't want it. Tilly, of course you do. Be quiet. I don't want the money. I won't take it. Oh, but you must. I've got to make it up to you somehow. I mean, think of all you'll be able to do. You can go about and travel and buy yourself nice clothes. Oh, really, Tilly, don't be so On the contrary, Miss Cuff shows the most remarkable good sense. As she herself has just proposed, a hundred a year. Oh, Simon, now you just be quiet. Tilly simply hasn't realised. Yes, I have. I've seen old women with money, alone in hotels. It's better than starving, of course, but I don't want to be alone. That's what's so dreadful when you're growing old. Oh, Issy, I've misjudged you. It's you who must forgive me. But, my darling, I don't want your money. Don't give it to me. Share it with me. And don't let us ever be parted again. Oh, my dear, now that's nonsense. You must take it all. Well, you'll be rich. Well, you can have a companion of your own. Well, I don't want a companion, and I don't want to travel or buy things. I just want to be with someone. Well, so you will. You'll make friends. You've never been able to make friends, poor Tilly. You've been too worried and nervous. But you'll make friends now, and you'll stay in lovely places. With you, with you. Don't turn me away, you see. I don't want friends. I want someone belonging to me. You say you're going to live with Dora, but Dora's no relation, and I am. We live here together. This house, too, Isabel? Are you going to give her the house, too? No, dear. The house is for Humphrey. I'm giving it to Humphrey, Tilly, because I shan't have anything to leave him. I hope you don't mind. Oh, I shan't mind anything as long as we're together. We can both live in an hotel. Well, I, I'd much rather live in an hotel if I'm not by myself and people know who I am. But we, well, we'll find a nice hotel, won't we, you see? Or if you'd rather travel, we'll travel. But we'll stay together all our lives and never be lonely anymore. Mrs. Brocken, you mustn't. That's what I want. That's what I've always wanted. Someone who belongs to me. A relation, so that people will know who I am and not look down on me. What you'd rather forget is that Aunt Isabel has other relations already. She has me, for example. Aunt Isabel, if you do give me this house, I very much hope that you'll continue to live in it. You? What will you want with Isabel when you're married and have a family here? We'll give you the house and welcome, but Issy and I won't live here. Tell him. Tell him he'd rather be with me, Issy. I'm owed it, aren't I, after all I've suffered? Tell them you'd rather live with your cousin. Oh, hold your tongue. Aunt Isabel. But... Issy, please tell them. Yes, yes, dear, I quite understand. I understand everything. Now go in and wash your eyes and I'll come in a moment. Promise me. Yes, dear, I promise. I just want a word with Simon first to clear everything up. Yes, Look, will someone tell me what the deuce has been happening? Miss Cuff. Offered your aunt's entire capital, prefers her company in an hotel, the arrangement to be a permanent one. But we mustn't let Mrs. Brocken. It would kill her. Of course I shan't let her. I'm not aware that Miss Cuff's society has actually killed anyone so far. Strikes me as a very suitable arrangement. All you care about is keeping the money in the family. At least Humphrey doesn't. At least Humphrey's disinterested. And he won't allow it. I certainly shall not. Simon, weren't you surprised? Considerably. Yes, I know I was. Oh, I'm so glad I never really thought badly of her. Oh, Aunt Isabel, the whole thing's preposterous. And I've just said that I shan't allow it. <laughs> really, dear? It isn't preposterous at all. In fact, now I think about it, I begin to see it's the best plan. Oh. Poor Tilly is dreadfully lonely. That's probably what's been the matter with her. But how can you bear to live with her? You can't. Oh, yes, I can. You couldn't. But Tilly won't bother me nearly as much as she would you. You and Humphrey don't understand, but in my young days, and Simon will remember it, people put up with their relations. I mean, some of ours weren't very nice, but they all came and stayed with us, and Ruth and I even had to go and stay with them. 
It's only lately that people feel they have a right to choose their own company. Oh, dear. I had looked forward to living with Dora. There it is. But it isn't. You haven't got to endure Miss Cuff. I believe I have, dear. It's no use giving people things they don't want, especially when there's something they do. Besides, when you get to our age, there's nothing like being with people who were young when you were. Aunt Tilly's memory is likely to be resentful, to hark back to McGregor. Well, perhaps. But I shan't mind talking about him myself, because he was fascinating. And, of course, I shall talk to Tilly about Mark, and there'll be other people in the hotel. You don't want to live in a hotel. Oh, but, dear, my hotel at Bath was very nice. There was a waiter. She'll be rude to waiters. Well, I can always smooth them down afterwards. I get on with waiters. They tell me about their families. The one at Bath... I expect she cheats at Bridge. Well, I shan't let her. If she cheats, I won't play with her. And if I don't play with her, Tilly might find it quite difficult to make up a four. Simon... Simon, now, aren't I right? Very probably. Anyone who plays bridge with you, my dear, can probably stand Miss Cuff as well. Yes, now, that's just what I meant. Tilly needs someone to, well, to make way for her a little. You'll find we shan't do so badly. I can think of no worse punishment for the worst crime than to live all my life with Tilly Cuff. Yes, but it won't be all my life, dear. I've had my life, all the best of it. I'm just on the last lap. Now I must go to Tilly. Please, can I have a word with you, ma'am? Uh, yes, Mrs. Poole? Well, I'm afraid I will have to go. That Miss Cuff. Is he? Oh, blimey, here she comes, ma'am. I'll come back later. Is he? Is he? You said you were coming straight in. Yes, so I am, dear. But there's just one thing I must settle first. Because Mrs. Poole is going to give notice again. Well, that didn't worry you now. Uh, yes, it does, dear. Because of Simon. And, of course, someone must look after him. Now, Tilly, I know you want me to send Greta to boarding school, but I'm not going But, but to. my dear, It's not I the don't... expense. I just don't believe the child would benefit Yes, but, uh, but it... Yes, and you must drop the idea of looking for Greta's father, because that's why the pools are so upset. And if it weren't for that, they'd stay. My dear, if they don't want to be helped, I'm sure I don't want to help them. Why should I? It's their own business. Thank you, Tilly. I'll tell Mrs. Poole at once. Now, come along in and finish dressing. My dear Isabel, I am dressed. This is a tea gown. Well, it looks very untidy for Sunday morning. Come along. It came from Pucker. Did it, dear? Well, tomorrow we'll send it to the cleaners. Well, I'll be blowed. Good heavens. Uncle Simon, do you know what we've just seen? Well, what have you just seen? We've seen my Aunt Isabel dealing with Tilly Cuff unhampered by conscience was a highly impressive sight. Mrs. Brocken said they'd get on well together. So they will. And there's an end of all our trouble over Tilly Cuff. The end for us because Mrs. Brocken's taken Tilly on for life. I still think it's heroic. So do I. Come on, Jackie. Let's give Uncle Simon a taste of the perfect peace after we're all gone. Goodbye. Oh. <sighs> <sighs> I say. Uh, eh? Oh. The Foolish Gentlewoman by Marjorie Sharp was adapted by Donald McWinney. It was the first of a series of some of Dame Thibble Sondyke's favourite plays, which will be broadcast from time to time in Saturday Night Theatre. Isabel Brocken was played by Sybil Thorndyke, Simon Brocken, Walter Fitzgerald, Tilly Cuff, Gladys Spencer, Dora Tremaine, Mary Wimbush, Jacqueline Brown, Eva Haddon, Humphrey Garrett, Anthony Jackson, Mrs. Poole, Marjorie Forsyth, and Greta Cecile Chevreau. The narrator was Preston Lockwood. The play was produced by Ronald Mason, and not by Graham Gold as advertised. Sybil Thorndyke is appearing in Arsenic and Old Lace at the Vaudeville Theatre, London. The 
greatest story ever told. Presented by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Tonight we present Call Not Any Man a Fool, a drama of human understanding of others, based on a teaching from the greatest life ever lived. Our scene is the town of Bethel in Judea, where in one house a man waits for his son. After looking through the doorway again, he turns to his wife... Rachel. Please, Samson, I know what you're going to say. And if you do, does that deprive me of the right to have my say in this household? Samson, after all, he's only a boy. It's when they're boys that their lives are shaped and formed. Of course. Well, will you tell me that I'm trying to do the boy harm? Do I try to teach him bad habits? Well, can't you be gentle with him? Gentle? How long can I indulge him in his foolish ways? The boy is not foolish. I have to say it, Rachel. Our son is a great disappointment to me. Oh, no, Samson. I never thought I'd hear you. Uh, I know it's not a nice thing to say, but I had such a plan for the boy. When he was born, I used to imagine what it would be like. The boy and I, good friends, proud of each other. The boy loves you, Sam. Maybe, but I want a son I can be proud of. A son that other people would envy us for. The boy will grow. He'll learn. Besides, there's, there's something about him. There that... certainly is. While the other boys are out playing games, displaying their strength, he roams the hills collecting stones and flowers and all sorts of things. He has natural curiosity. Well, he'll learn to have some curiosity about the things I want him to do. And when he... Ah. There you are. Yes, Father? Well, out with it. Where have you been? It's almost dark. Yes, sir. Well, my dear, did you hear the... Brilliant answer my son gave me. He quite agrees with me that it's dark. We're making progress. Come here. Samson. Now then, where were you till this hour? Out. Playing games with the other boys, perhaps? Learning to hurl a spear or run swiftly? Well? No, sir. I know that. Because I saw the other boys at play. Do you know that Andrew can hurl a spear almost as far as I could when I was a boy? Yes, I was the best in all Bethel in my youth. But you, can you even hurl one correctly? No. And why? Because you don't try. And in the evening when all the men gather and they talk about their sons, what do I have to say? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I have to say it, son. I'm disappointed in you. Father, I, I try. Samson, leave the boy alone. That's what I mean. How can I make an impression on the boy's mind when you're always coming between us? Rachel, we have a man-child, a great honor, a very fortunate thing in view of the fact that you... Samson, please. I'm sorry. Go to your room, Philip. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Rachel. I'd rather have cut out my tongue than said anything like that. I know how you risked your life to have the child. Please, Samson, anything. I could stand anything. Only never reproach me for that. I'm sorry, more sorry than I can tell you. But it's because he's our only child that I want so much for him to be everything I dreamed. Well, then if you feel that way, try with the boy. Be kinder to him. Spend more time with him. I'll do it. But honestly, Rachel, I have no faith in our son. No faith. He's a fool. A fool. But I'll try. Here, Samson, I packed some fresh cheese and bread, and there's a crock of milk hanging in the well. Everything, Samson, for you and your son to have a fine day together. Thanks. I'll give the boy every chance to prove himself. I promise you that. Good. And I'm taking his spear along. 
At first, I'll pretend I'm using it only as a walking staff. But when we get far away from town, I'm going to show him how to hurl it. And we'll practice and practice until he's as good as the other boys. You'll see. Oh, I hope he pleases you. Me? What about him? I'm doing this for his sake, too, you know. Of course. Now, take the food and don't forget the crock in the well. And, Samson, I pray you two will return better friends. Are you, son? Oh, no, Father. I could walk all day like this with you. Well, I must confess I'm getting a little hungry. How about you? Well, I've been hungry for quite a while. I thought if you could wait, so could I. Then there's no need to wait any longer. We'll stop here. We'll have that fine meal your mother prepared for us. Mm. This is a good place right here. Here, Father? Shall we sit here? If you like. And let me open the napkin with the bread and cheese. Here we are. Go on, Philip. Help yourself. Thank you, sir. Meanwhile, I'll take the cover off the milk crack. There we are. Drink. Yes, Father. Uh, of course, after we've eaten, I think we ought to rest a while. Hmm? If you think it's best. Yes, and uh, as long as we have the spear with us, why, uh, maybe we'll be able to practice hurling it. Hmm? What do you say? Hurling the spear? Father, I, I don't do that very well. You might be disappointed in me again. If you don't do it well at first, we'll practice for a while. Yeah. All right, huh? But I... Yes, Father. We'll practice. <laughs> We'll try it once more, Philip. Yes, sir. You take hold of the spear here. You see? Yes, sir. Ah. Well, just don't stand there. Take hold of it. Yes, sir. Now, raise your arm to about here. That's right. Now, take two steps forward like this. One, two, and hurl it with all your might. I'll now, try. I'll try, sir. Oh, Philip. Philip, can't you do anything right What's the matter with you? I don't know, sir. I tried. Well, go get the spear. Try it again. Go on. Yes, sir. Of course, I'll say one thing for you. The way you throw a spear, you don't have to walk far. Yes, sir. Now, try it as I told you. And don't be so slow about it. Mm. Ah, that's better. Better. Now we're making progress. Now, try it again. And this time, throw your whole body forward as you do it. Get every muscle into it. Yes, sir. Well, the spear, it's broken. Couldn't have. I can tell by the way it sounded when it struck. The shaft is perfectly sound. Well, I know, but but the point's been blunted. It struck a rock. We can still get on with our practice. Well, I, I'd rather not practice anymore. You mean you're tired already? Well, it's not that I'm tired, but but this rock the spear struck, it, it's so unusual. Rock's a rock. There's nothing unusual about any of them. Some are bigger, some are smaller, that's all. Oh, no, sir. Look, the coloring of it and how smooth it is. So different from the others you find around here. What did you say? This rock is different, just as there are different flowers and different kinds of insects. Why should this rock be smooth when others are jagged? Did you ever think of that, Father? Well, I... Tell me, Philip, is this what you spend all your time doing when you're away from the house? Why, yes, sir. What kind of foolish nonsense is that? How could any son of mine be interested in such fool ideas? What's the matter with you, Philip? We have a tradition of fighting heroes behind us. Joshua, Saul, David. Yes, David, a boy who slew Goliath, a warrior, a leader, a king of Israel. And look at you. Rocks. Flowers. You're a disgrace to the memory of our ancestors. Uh, what do you have to say for yourself? Father, I... I can't help it. But... 
Well, David was a warrior. But Solomon, his son, he was a scholar, a poet, wasn't he, Father? And if he was? Did he disgrace his father, David? Are you comparing yourself to Solomon? Well, now I've heard everything. I promised your mother I'd do my best, and I did. But you're hopeless, Philip, hopeless. Just a born fool, I guess. Come on. Come home. I give up with you. Well, where is he now? Please, Samson, you've frightened him enough. Frightened him? He's a boy. He shouldn't be frightened of anything. Where is he? I, I don't know. After what happened yesterday, I haven't tried to order him about. Samson, did you call the boy a fool? Well, I... Well, I had to make an impression on that stubborn mind of his. You shouldn't have done it. Then why not? If I can't convince him, I'll try to goad him into doing the right thing. Maybe if the boy gets angry enough, he'll become determined to do what I want. He's frightened. He doesn't know how to become angry. But he knows how to confuse me with his strange manner and his talk. Comparing himself to Solomon... Did he tell you about that? Well, he's like other boys, and that's just the way I'll treat him. He's not to be punished, Samson. I suppose we'll give him another chance, and another, and another, and he'll never learn. No, he's had his last chance. Last chance? Wait. Samson. What is it, Rachel? This morning when I talked to him, I said you'd give him another chance. Uh, But he didn't seem to believe me. He didn't. Samson. Rachel. Rachel. No, he wouldn't do it. Well, he's never stayed away this late before, has he? He wouldn't. I'll find out. Where are you going? To his room to see. But you know he's not there. There's something else I want to find out. Rachel, please. What are you looking for, Rachel? Philip's stones and things. All the things he's collected. Well? They're gone. All gone. And he's gone too, Samson. Oh, my boy. Oh, Please, Rachel. I don't believe it. He's not the kind of boy who would run off. He isn't. And yet, he's gone. Gone. Tell me, Micah, you're his teacher. Where would my son have gone? And why? Samson, your boy's gone? What do you mean? Run off into the night somewhere. I don't know. Rachel's going from house to house searching for him. We can't find him. Oh, that's too bad. Such a fine lad. So smart. This is no time for idle flattery, Micah. No, no matter what the boy is, I must find him. After all, he's my son. What do you mean, Samson? I forgive the boy everything. Only I must find him. I must get him back. What is there to forgive? The lad's smart in school, and he has such ingenious ways of collecting knowledge. I tell you, I learn almost as much from him as he learns from me. What? Of course. He keeps all of us entertained with his little talks on rocks and flowers. I believe the other boys would rather listen to him than to me. Ah, useless knowledge, all of it. There is no knowledge that is useless, Samson. It develops the boy's mind. I have no time to talk to you about it now, Mike. Do you or don't you know where the boy is? I'm sorry. I don't. But I hope you find him. I sincerely hope so. Jonathan, Jonathan, have you seen my boy? Philip? Gone? Yes, have you seen him? No, Samson, but I wouldn't worry about him. Any boy who knows this countryside as well as Philip does isn't a boy you have to worry about. He's not lost. He's... Jonathan, he's run away. Philip? Run away? Must have been something dreadful, Samson, to make him do that. Well, just a disagreement between us. How could you quarrel with such a boy? He's a fine lad. I often wish my Andrew were more like him. Andrew? Yes. But Andrew's one of the best boys around here. Can hurl a spear further than the rest. And if he can, 
There are other things I'd like him to learn. Things your Philip knows. Now that he's lost, I'd like to help find him. But I wouldn't know where to look. I must find him. I must. Where could he have gone? John, people are gathering again to hear the master. John, do you hear me? What, Peter? No, you didn't hear me. Something's on your mind, John. What is it? Over there. That boy. Well, he's come to hear the master. Is there anything wrong in that? It's the way the boy looks around him. As though he's afraid something or someone will catch up with him. There's a boy who's in trouble. Then it's our duty to help. Come. Son, is there anything we can... Oh, what do you want? We thought there was something we could do for you. Me? No. I'm all right. Of course you are. But maybe you could help us. Me? Help you? Yes. Uh, there's a boy somewhere around here, and he's alone and in some kind of trouble. And uh, if, if we could help him, it would make John and me feel very much better. Now, if you've seen such a boy... A boy in trouble? Yes. Well, I... I guess you could say I'm in trouble. If you'd feel better helping someone, you could help me. Would you let us do that? Well, sure. Well, that's just fine. You come with us, son. And it's your good luck that we're just about to eat our midday meal. Isn't it, John? Is that all you can eat, son? Yes, sir. We'll have to be content with that, Peter. <laughs> now, my boy, what is this trouble you're in? No, nobody wants me. I see. Well, that's too bad, son. You see, I can't hurl a spear. Is that so? And nobody wants you because of that? Well, maybe not nobody, but my father doesn't. Your father, huh? Yes, sir. You see, he thinks that all the rocks and flowers and things, that they don't count. They're not interesting or anything. But you think they are? Oh, yes, sir. I think they're interesting. But you'll laugh. No, we won't, son. Well, I think they're beautiful. Even as the master does. For they're God's work. God's work. Yes, sir. I, I never thought of it that way, but it's true. It is. And the master, he feels the same way I do. I don't know what to say. Perhaps you'd better not say anything more, son. You look tired. A little sleep might make you feel better uh, if you haven't slept all night. Tell the truth, sir. I haven't. Then come along, son. Sleep is what you'll have. Please, someone, tell me, have you seen a lone boy? But I must find my son. Friend, there are others here who want to listen to the master's words. Who are you? Uh, have you seen a boy, a lost boy? My name is Peter. I'm one of the master's followers. And as for having seen a boy, I've seen many. But this one was lost. I thought he might have come here. Somehow I feel he'd come to the master if he were in trouble. And is he in trouble? My son... He's run away. Oh, I see. John, did you hear? A boy who's run away? Oh? He wouldn't have been carrying a spear, would he? My son? 
I'm afraid not. He must be a fine boy, then. What do you mean by that? How much good has ever been done by hurling a spear, friend? Well, uh, uh, I... I hadn't thought of that. There are some boys who have more important interests in life. Is that right, John? Yes, Peter. Some, for example, who seek after knowledge of different things. After the beauty of God's creation. Aren't there, Peter? Why, from the way you talk, you must have seen my son. We do have one boy here who would fit your description. Then I must see him. Take me to him at once, please. First, we must take you to someone else. Someone else? Yes, to the master. Me? You'd take me to the master? But why? He has something to say to you. The master is aware of me? More than you know. Come along, man. Come along. Please, you must be making some mistake. The master couldn't want to talk to me. Master, here is the man. The one we spoke of to you. You spoke about me? What have I done? Why do you bring me here? To the master. Ye have heard... That it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, That whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Vain one shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Does this apply to me? Whom have I? Oh. What is it, friend? I haven't hated anyone, but I have called someone a fool. Now the master says it's a crime. Hellfire, the master said, for calling someone a fool. Why? Why? Because, though it's not one of those crimes punishable on earth, it's the kind of crime that cuts deepest and leaves the greatest wound. But if someone's wrong, if he does foolish Who's things, he... To say? What a man does in his enthusiasm may be wrong. But shall we rob him of his enthusiasm because we don't agree with him? How else is the world to go forward? How else is new thought to be born? Great men have been called fools. Even greater men will be called fools. And to do so can be the greatest crime of all. For it destroys people. Then... And I'm a criminal, John. And if the master wants to have me punished for the great wrong I've done my son, I'm ready to take my punishment. I can see in your face that you've been punished enough. You've punished yourself by driving your son from you. And now, Peter, shall we help this man find his son? Quiet. The boy is still sleeping. My son. My son. What's that he's clutching to his body? A collection of rocks and flowers and things he loves. He showed them all to us. I know. I taunted him about them. Son. Philip. Hmm? What? Father. I. Philip, Philip, look at me. There's nothing to cry about. Now I've found you. I'll take you back home. Home? Of course. Your mother and I, we want you. We need you. But all the things you said to me, I thought you didn't love me. I'm a fool. How could you love me? I loved you as much as anyone could love a son. 
I just didn't understand you. I didn't know how wrong I'd been. But now we're going home together. Is it true? Is it? Yes, son, it's true. Your father wants you. And your mother's waiting for you. And on the way home, you can tell me all those interesting things you tell your classmates and your teacher. You'd really want to hear them? Of course. Then we'll go. As soon as I thank these two men for helping me, they fed me and gave me a place to sleep. Thank you, sirs. Yes. Thank you, sirs, for giving me back my son. For having the master teach me a lesson I needed very badly. From now on, no more cruel words for my son. Because I'll keep repeating to myself what the master said. That'll help me to understand. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, vain one, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. program was brought to you by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Next week on this same network at this time, we'll present The Calling of Matthew, another episode in the greatest story ever told from the greatest life ever lived. is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Chapter 5 of the Chaucer Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. The Chaucer Storybook by Eva March Tappan. Chapter 5. The Nun's Priest Tale. 
the cock the hen and the fox when the prioress had ended her story of little hugh of lincoln the whole company looked thoughtful this did not suit the cheerful host he turned to the nun's priest and said come you sir john tell us some pleasant tale to make us merry yes mine host replied the priest i will tell a tale and by my spurs it shall be a merry one then without prelude or introduction he began his story once upon a time a poor widow no longer young lived in a little cottage in a valley not far from a grove she had two daughters and only a small income but she was very economical and so they managed to live she cared for three pigs three cows and a sheep called mal of course her meals were scanty but she never needed any pungent sauce to give them flavor and she was never ill from overeating if she had wished to dance the gout would never have prevented her and surely apoplexy never hurt her head for she drank neither red wine nor white the two colors that were oftenest seen on her table were black and white for there were two things of which she had plenty black bread and milk she also had a bit of broiled bacon now and then and sometimes an egg or two this poor widow had a hen-yard and in it she kept a rooster called chanticleer there was not another cock in all the land that would crow as well as he his voice was merrier than the merry organ that plays in the church on mass days and one could tell the hour by his crowing better than any clock he seemed to know astronomy by nature for as soon as the sun had risen exactly fifteen degrees he crowed and he crowed so well there was no bettering it he was handsome too by far the handsomest rooster in the place his comb was redder than the finest coral and all notched in battlements like a castle wall his bill was black and shone like jet his legs and toes were of a beautiful azure his nails were whiter than the lily flower and his feathers gleamed like burnished gold about this cock were seven hens their color was much like his but by far the fairest was demoiselle partelota as she was called she was so courteous and discreet and such a cheerful companion and had behaved herself so excellently ever since she was a week old that chanticleer loved her with his whole heart and he was never happy away from her they often sang together and it was the greatest treat that could be imagined to hear them just at sunrise when their voices chimed in the song my love is far away it came to pass one morning early when chanticleer was sitting on the perch among his seven wives that he began to groan as if he was troubled by some bad dream pertolota sat beside him of course and when she heard him groan she cried sweetheart what troubles you what makes you groan the cock replied madam do not be anxious it was only a dream but it was such a terrible one that i am frightened even to remember it i dreamed that i was walking up and down the yard when i saw a dreadful creature somewhat like a dog and it tried to kill me it was between yellow and red its tail and ears were tipped with black its nose was small and its eyes glowed like fire that must have been what made me groan for i am afraid even now then said dame partelota fie upon you for a chicken-hearted cock pluck up your courage if you would keep my love for no woman can admire a coward we long every one of us to have a husband who is bold and brave and generous he must know how to keep a secret and he must be wise he must not be frightened at the sight of a knife and he must not be a braggart are you not ashamed to tell your love that you are afraid of anything you have a beard haven't you the heart of a man dreams are nothing and to think you are afraid of them dreams often come from overeating and sometimes when one has too much red humor that would make him see visions of arrows and flames of fire and red creatures that he fears will bite him that is what the red humor does just as the black humor or melancholy makes many a man cry out in his sleep for fear of black bears and bulls or black devils i could tell you more of humors that trouble men in sleep do you not remember that cato said pay no heed to dreams now dearest she continued when we fly down from here i pray you take some medicine there are herbs and berries right in our own yard that will cure you 
I will point them out to you. Madam, the cock replied, I thank you for your learning. Cato was a wise man, but there has been many a man of greater wisdom than he who does not agree with him, and who has learned by experience that dreams signify either joy or sorrow. One of the most famous authors that men read tells the story of two men who set off together on a pilgrimage. On the way they came to a little village, so crowded that there was no room for them both in the same house. One chanced to find a comfortable lodging, but the other could do no better than to lie down in a stall with oxen all about him. In the middle of the night, the man who was well lodged dreamed that his friend called to him and said, "'Help me, dear brother. Come to me quickly, or I shall be murdered here in an ox's stall.' He woke with a start, and then thought, how foolish to be troubled by a dream so he turned over and went to sleep again the same dream came to him a second time and a second time he said how foolish and went to sleep a third dream came and this time the friend did not call for help but said i have been slain look at my gaping wounds i was murdered for my money then point by point the man told in the dream how it had come about at last he said if you would get up early in the morning and go to the west gate of the town you will see a cart full of rubbish don't be afraid to stop the cart for my body will be hidden in the rubbish this time the man did not say how foolish and as soon as it was day he went to the ox's stall and called for his friend the innkeeper said sir your friend rose early and went out of town then the man went to the west gate and there he saw a cart of rubbish looking just as his friend had described it in the dream at this he began to believe the dream must be true he cried out aloud for vengeance my murdered friend lies in this cart he declared fearlessly you officers who ought to keep this town i call upon you for vengeance and justice murder will out it is such a loathsome thing that God will not suffer it to be concealed. The people gathered all around. They overturned the cart, and in the midst of the rubbish they found the body of the murdered man. Then the officers of the town seized the carter and the innkeeper and tortured them until they confessed the crime, and straightway they were hanged. You can see by this that there is truth in dreams, and now look at that same book, and the very next chapter beyond this, I read about two men who wanted to cross the sea to a distant country. They waited a long while, for the wind was contrary. At last it changed and blew just as they wished. They planned to start early in the morning and went to bed happy. But while they were asleep, a wondrous thing happened, for one of them dreamed that a man stood by his bedside and said, If you sail tomorrow, you will be drowned he started out of his sleep and called his friend and told him of the dream let us put off the voyage for one day he said but his friend only laughed at him for being so foolish as to trust in dreams no dream would ever frighten me he declared so that i would give up my business for it dreams are only nonsense people dream of all sorts of wild fancies that never were and never will be I see, however, that you are bound to stay here and lose the wind. I pity you for your folly, and I say farewell. He went on board the boat and started on his voyage, but before it was half done, something happened. I do not know what, save that the ship sprang a leak and went to the bottom, and the man was drowned. And now, dearest Partelota, you see that one ought not to be careless of dreams but let us not talk of this any more for when i gaze into your lovely face and see the beautiful scarlet red about your eyes i forget all about my fears i am so happy that i do not care a straw for any dreams or visions but now the dawn had come chanticleer flew down from the roost and called his hens and when he had found a kernel of corn he clucked to them and stood one side to watch them eat it and certainly no one who saw him looking as brave as a lion and walking up and down the yard on the tips of his toes as if he scorned the ground too much to more than touch it 
would ever imagine him afraid of anything, and yet trouble lay but a little way before him. As evil fate would have it, there was a wicked fox that had lived for three years in the grove near the cottage. For a long while he had been trying to plan some way to get Chanticleer, and that same night he had slipped softly through a break in the hedge into the yard and had hidden in a bed of cabbages. There he lay, watching with his half-shut eyes, the noble rooster walking proudly up and down the yard. The early morning had passed, and nine o'clock had come. Dame Pertolota, the beautiful, was bathing in the clean, warm sand, and her sisters were not far away. Chanticleer was singing as merry as a mermaid, but suddenly he was watching a butterfly fluttering here and there among the cabbages. He caught sight of the fox lying half hidden among them. His heart turned cold, and his beautiful music of crowing died in his throat. He cried hoarsely, Ock! Ock! in the greatest fear. In another moment he would have run away, but the fox spoke so gently and courteously that he could not help listening to him. "'Gentle, sir,' said the crafty fox, "'I beg of you not to fear so true a friend as I. I should be worse than a fiend to do one like you any harm. I pray you do not think for an instant that I came for any other reason than because I longed so eagerly to hear your singing from nigh at hand that I could not stay away. Indeed, dear sir, you have as sweet a voice as any angel in heaven.' pardon me for addressing you but truly i count myself no stranger to your noble family my lord your father god bless his soul and also your mother have honoured my poor house by becoming its guests but to speak again of singing i never heard any one except yourself sing so wondrous well as your father used to do at the dawning he had a habit of making his voice stronger by standing on tiptoe and stretching out his neck then he would close his eyes and send forth the sweetest music, save your own, that was ever heard. And as for wisdom and discretion, there was not a person anywhere in the world who could surpass him. Kind sir, would you, out of the pure goodness of your heart, sing to me once more, and let my fancy that I am listening to your father's voice? No one had ever praised Chanticleer so delightfully before. Of course he could not refuse so small a request to one who had shown how fully he enjoyed the best of music. So he stood high upon his toes, stretched out his neck, closed his eyes, and began to crow. His song was indeed louder than ever before, so loud that he did not hear the fox stealthily creeping closer to him, and while he was straining his voice till the valley re-echoed with his crowing, the treacherous fox caught him by the throat and ran toward the woods, the cock upon his back. When Troy was burned, the women wept and lamented, but truly never before was there heard such a crying and screaming as came from the feathered ladies of the yard, when they saw the terrible fate that had befallen their noble lord and master. Poor Dame Pertolota shrieked louder than all the rest, but the outcries of any one of them might well have reached the skies. The widow and her daughters heard the alarm and ran to the door. There were hens in the yard in the grove, and there was the wicked fox, the thief and murderer, running at the top of his speed with a rooster on his back. The woman cried, Stop! Stop! A fox! A fox! and ran after him as fast as they could go. The men caught up sticks and ran. The dog Call ran, and Talbot and Garland and Malkin with a distaff in her hand. The cow and the calf ran, even the hogs, for they were so frightened at the shouting of the people and the barking of the dogs that they ran, squealing all the way like very fiends. The ducks quacked as if they thought men were trying to kill them. The geese squawked, took wing, and flew over the tops of the trees. The swarm of bees came buzzing out of the hives and flew after them. And this was not all, for the people ran home to get trumpets of brass and boxwood and horn and bone. They bellowed, they blew, they shouted, they bawled, they hooted and roared and yelled and howled and screeched and screamed, till they raised such a hullabaloo as was never heard on earth before. And all this time the fox was running toward the wood with a cock on his back. 
some folk behave better when they are troubled than when all goes smoothly with them and chanticleer was one of these people he knew well that the fox could reach his hole before the pursuers could catch up with him and that whatever was done must be done at once he had grown far wiser since he had been taken prisoner and he said calmly to his captor sir if i were you i would defy all that rabble i would say to them turn back proud men a plague upon you all i am close to the grove and i will eat the cock in spite of you in faith declared the fox that is the very thing i will do but the cock was ready and the instant the fox opened his mouth to speak he broke loose flapped his wings and in another moment he was perched high upon a tree the fox was too wily to be put out of countenance by even such a surprise as this he looked up meekly into the tree and said in a humble voice my dear chanticleer i am heartily ashamed of myself and i beg your pardon most submissively i ought to have remembered that you were not used to my ways and would not have startled you so when i brought you out of your yard honestly sir i never thought of doing you any harm if you will kindly come down to the ground where we just may talk more comfortably i shall be glad to explain the matter to you no sir replied the cock with just a bit of an exultant crow may the fiends take me if you cheat me more than once you will not get me to sing and shut up my eyes again for no one will ever thrive who shuts up his eyes when he ought to keep them open end of chapter five Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Each week at this time, Kraft presents from Hollywood, California, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you that these are challenging days for every one of us. It's our duty to produce more to help meet our country's increasing needs. And that takes plenty of good food, as you wise homemakers know. Wholesome, nutritious food that provides the energy and nourishment your hard-working, hard-playing family needs. That's why you should know about parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is a delicious food that's packed full of wholesome nourishment. It's one of the best sources of food energy you can serve. And important to you housewives who know how essential vitamins are, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A, making it a reliable year-round source for your whole family. What's more, parquet is the margarine with the delicious flavor, whether you use it at the table for baking or for pan frying. So why not give your family the benefit of this grand-tasting, nourishing food? Tomorrow... Ask your dealer for a pound or two of economical parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve. Come on, wake up, Judge Hooker. Pay attention to your checkers. It's your move. I know it, Gildersleeve. I was merely studying the board. What, with your eyes closed? <laughs> Let's speed this up. We haven't got all night here. All right. There, 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 and there. <laughs> now crown me. I'd love to, but I haven't got anything to do it with. Hooker, I don't see how you keep beating me, honestly. In fact, I don't think you do, honestly. <laughs> Gildersleeve, you're a pushover. You couldn't win a game from a backward baboon with a dozen checkers up your sleeve. I could, too. Um, I mean, I wouldn't need a dozen checkers. I'll show you, Hooker. Set him up again and pull in your belt. Because this time I'm going to beat the hell of Leroy. How are you tonight? Hi, Uncle Mort. Hello, Judge Hooker. Leroy? Sam, can I... Uh, can you what, Leroy? 
Well, I hate to keep pestering you, Bart, but can I see the circus tomorrow afternoon? Not unless they happen to pitch the tent in the front yard of the Peter B. Flugelhammer Junior High School. Is that where you go, Leroy? Yeah, Flugie Junior High. Say, I grew up with Peter B. Flugelhammer Sr. That's who the junior high school was named after. If, well, I thought the school was named after Peter B. Flugelhammer Jr. No, Jr. was the son of Sr. after whom the junior high school was named. Poor Jr. He never could finish senior high. Yo. But gee, Uncle Mort, could you call up school and ask if I could skip tomorrow? I did, Leroy. I even went so far as to predict that you wouldn't be feeling very well tomorrow. What did they say? They told me that an excuse for illness while the circus is in town must be accompanied by a note from your doctor. Shucks, that's a heck of a note. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, there's no use grousing, young man. Remember, school must come first. Now, sit down and get started with your homework. Yes, Leroy, your homework, that's the thing that's going to count in later life, not going to the circus. I don't think so, Judge, because in my later life, I expect to be a lion tamer. Oh? You don't need any education for that. All you need is a kitchen chair and the right kind of breakfast food. <laughs> well, yes. This lion taming is new, though. Last week, you were going to become a pitcher with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh, that was last week. Oh. Gee, I wouldn't mind missing the circus so much, Uncle Mort, but I hate to see those passes go to waste. Oh, did you get passes, Gildersleeve? Did I get passes? Yes, sir. I've got certain connections. Yeah, Uncle Mort guessed the right number of beans in that jar in the drugstore window. Oh. Yes, I connected that time. <laughs> Gee, Uncle Mort, are you sure you can't take me? Uh, I'm sorry, Leroy, but you'd better make up your mind to skip the circus. Oh, gee, a guy can't get any fun out of life. Yeah. You know, Gildersleeve, sometimes I think our school system has become too scientific, too streamlined. You're right, Judge. These days, everything is streamlined. Uh, except me. <laughs> Yes. Things were a lot different in the days when I went to school. <laughs> what a memory. I sat, I sat next to Petey Flugelhammer. Huh? That was long before he was elected lieutenant governor and then named the school after himself. Oh. We had none of this modern stuff like getting a doctor's prescription to go to the circus. Yes, it was the same in my school days too, Judge. Of course, I'm not as old as you are. What do you mean, Gildersleeve? You were shaving when I was a little shaver. I was not. You were too. All right, all right. I was always taught not to contradict my elders. <laughs> it, come to think of it, Judge, we kids used to have a lot more fun than modern children have. I can still remember some of the tricks we pulled at school. So do I. Shenanigans, they were called. Yes. I'll never forget the time I dropped a paper bag full of water on the Spanish teacher. Only it turned out to be the new athletic coach. And when he caught me, boy, was he athletic. <laughs> That's nothing. I once sneaked up behind Miss Pettibone's desk and tacked her dress to the floor. <laughs> kids don't do a thing like that these days. Yeah, kids can't do a thing like that these days. <laughs> Say, uh, Judge, did you ever put eggs in the principal's umbrella? No, did you? Uh-huh. I had my own hen and I saved eggs for a rainy day. <laughs> <laughs> I can still see him lifting that umbrella over his head. <laughs> well, I put alum in the water pitcher at our graduation exercises. Oh, that's a peachy stunt. <laughs> what happened? I didn't graduate. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, youth. Sometimes I wish I were a kid again, just so I could pull a few more of those cute little innocent juvenile pranks. Well, they're a thing of the past. Yeah. I never hear of kids doing those things these days. Not enough imagination, I guess. That's right. You know, I remember when a dog and pony show came to our town and all us kids made up our minds to go. You know how we got the afternoon off? No, how? Well, I climbed up on the schoolhouse roof and stuffed my coat into the chimney. <laughs> Boy, I wish you could have seen that smoke pour in and those kids pour out. <laughs> <laughs> Gildy, I'll bet you were car. Oh, that wasn't anything. Did I ever tell you about the time we smuggled the horse up in the bell tower at college? No, <laughs> Uncle Mort, tell us about it. Well, I borrowed this. Leroy, I didn't know that you were still here. Sure, you told me to do my homework. Say, did you ever do any homework, Uncle Mort? Uh, stacks of it. Gee, when did you find the time? Didn't it interfere with your jokes? Uh, now see what you've done, Gildersleeve, giving the boy a wrong impression of our childhood. Me? You started it, tacking teacher's skirts to the floor. <laughs> and you, a superior court judge. Why aren't you ashamed? Well, how about you, egging the principal on and trying to brain everybody with bags of water? What do you mean, everybody? Just our Spanish teacher, Miss Olofsson, that's all. <laughs> now, Leroy, don't get us wrong. Judge Hooker and I were merely reminiscing about an era that doesn't exist anymore. I'll say it doesn't. You couldn't get away with those corny gags today. Those gags weren't corny, Leroy. They were mighty clever. Uh, <coughs> huh? oh, oh, yes, yes. They were terrible. Uh, the big kids made me do them. I'm ashamed of myself. Aren't you, Judge Hooker? Yes. 
I was a bad boy. <laughs> you, you see, Leroy? Gee, you two treat me as if I was 12 years old. You are 12 years old, Leroy. Sure, I know, but I don't like to be treated that way. Yeah. You'll have to hurry, Marjorie, if you're going to the circus with me. I'm almost ready. What's the rush, Uncle Mort? Well, I'd like to get there on time for once. No matter when I start, it seems I always arrive in time to get caught in the opening procession. One year, a hippopotamus chased me around the ring twice. I never did find my seat. <laughs> it's too bad Leroy couldn't get off from school to come with us. Yes, the poor boy. Well, we'll bring him back a red balloon and a little whip it, with a tassel. <laughs> hey, anybody home? Hi. Leroy. Gee, I'm glad I caught you before you left for the circus. Well, Leroy, what are you doing home at this hour? School was dismissed just now. Come on, let's go to the circus. By the way, Leroy... Why were classes dismissed? Well, uh, you might call it an accident. Accident? What was the accident? Oh, nothing serious. Then what was it? Oh, it seems they had to get all the students out quick on account of all the rooms had to be aired out. Aired out? They did? Why? Well, nobody knows for sure exactly, but the general opinion is that uh, somehow or other, a stunt got into the air conditioning system. Oh! <laughs> Circus swell. Mm -hmm. Best I've ever seen. How did you like the fellow who did the swan dive into the tank of burning gasoline, Uncle Mort? I liked him, but I don't think Secretary Ickes would. <laughs> Leroy, there's something that's been troubling me. It's that skunk in your school. You mean Mr. Proctor, the principal? No, Leroy. <laughs> the one that got into the air conditioning system. Do you happen to know how it got in there? No, I don't. Say, remember the tiger that rode on the elephant's back? How did they train him to do that, Uncle Mort? Oh, with kindness, I suppose. Uh, Leroy, did you happen to have anything to do with it? With the tiger, Uncle Mort? No, the skunk! That wasn't a skunk, Uncle. It was a tiger. Tigers and skunks have different kinds of stripes. I know they have. I'm talking about school. But, you know, I've been thinking. Isn't it a strange coincidence that this accident occurred on the day the circus came to town? Yeah, funny, ain't it? Uh, yeah. Say, Uncle Mort, what do you think would happen if when the lion tamer had his head in the lion's mouth, the lion suddenly had a sneeze? Well, I don't think anyone would say tight. <laughs> <laughs> now, Leroy, I hope that nothing Judge Hooker and I said about our school day pranks caused you to try to imitate us. Oh, no, sir. You understand we were just talking about old times. Yes, sir, like Judge Hooker says. That's about all you old-timers have got left. Your memory. Yeah. What did you say? Uh, good afternoon, Bertie. Is Leroy home from school yet? Well, let me look in the refrigerator. Uh, no, sir. Did you expect to find him in there? <laughs> no, but I can tell if he's here by what ain't. <laughs> well, maybe he wasn't hungry this afternoon That boy, why, he's nothing but appetite held together by skin and bones oh, What's the matter? Well, there's a lot of strange things going on at Leroy's school And I'm afraid that maybe I'm partly to blame How come you messing around the school? Is you one of them pants teachers? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just that Judge Hooker and I were talking about some little pranks we used to play when we were in school a little uh, harmless things, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, well, Leroy happened to overhear us, and now I'm afraid he's showing us the modern versions with the uh, chromium trimmings. Uh-huh. Uh, what makes you think little Leroy's doing for my diddles? Well, uh, did you read the afternoon paper? No, sir. It never gets to me till the following morning. Oh, yes. Well, I've got it right here. Listen to this. Juvenile Joker startles school. Police were called early today to investigate a large, stout lady's body seen suspended from the window of Principal Poultney Proctor at Flugelhammer Junior High School. Oh, who was it, Miss Proctor? Yes. No, listen. Closer inspection revealed that the body was a dummy, stuffed with old football pads, wearing a green and purple silk dress, size 48. Green and purple silk? Size 48? Yes. Yeah. Sounds like my Sunday go-to-meeting dress, the one that was kidnapped off the clothesline last night. Yes, doesn't it? 
Well, what's my dress doing in the newspaper? Uh, I don't know, Bertie. <laughs> Shh, hey, Bertie, here comes Leroy. Do you think he did it? Shh. Yeah. Afternoon, Uncle Morse. Hiya, Bertie. Say, is this your old dress? That's my new dress, Leroy, and what you doing with it? Why, Piggy Banks just gave it to me. He says the wind must have blown it over into his yard. He found it under a window. Young man, isn't this the dress that was hanging out of Mr. Proctor's window this morning? You mean on the dummy that was suspended from school? If... Well, how could it be if it belongs to Bertie? What do you think, Bertie? I ain't saying nothing. I'm only too glad to get my dress back without paying ransom. I'm going to hide it this time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Uh, look, Leroy, uh, don't think of me just as your uncle and your guardian. Uh, think of me as your pal, uh, your buddy. Now, if there's anything that's troubling your little mind, why don't you just come right out with it? Well... Okay, Unc, there is something that's been bothering me. I understand. Go right ahead, my boy. What is it? Well, how did you ever get that horse up into the bell tower at college? Oh! I asked you to come here tonight, Judge Hooker, is because you and I are turning Leroy's school topsy-turvy. Why, I haven't been near the place... We've been doing it by remote control. Remember how we shot off our mouths in front of Leroy about our school day monkey shines? Yes, and say, I just remembered another one. Forget it. Leroy has been up to all our old tricks. Oh, his teachers have caught him, huh? No, that kid's smarter than we were. But we got to stop him from going on with him. Well, maybe if I gave him a little lecture... Hooker, you don't understand children. That wouldn't work at all. We've got to pretend we don't know what's going on. That shouldn't be hard for you to do. <laughs> when Leroy comes in, that'll be our cue to start casually chatting about the evils of practical joking. Yeah. Yeah, subtle propaganda, you know. How about it, Hooker? We can try it. Too bad this whole thing had to happen. You know, Gildersleeve, it would never have started if you hadn't opened your fat face. Me? Why, it was you that started it, you little travesty on justice. Is that so? Why, Gildersleeve, if you had the intelligence of a jackass... Uh, but no, why should I daydream? <laughs> There's no use arguing with you. Why not? Because I don't argue with blubberheads. Well, I do, you blubberhead. <laughs> Just because you're a judge, do you think? No, I can answer that myself. You don't think. Don't you provoke me, you big water wind. Oh, that settles it. I'm going to lambaste you with... Oh. Excuse me, I didn't think... Oh, anybody... uh, oh, come right in, Leroy. I was, uh, I was just telling Judge Hooker how to, uh, baste a lamb. Wasn't I, Judge Hooker? <laughs> huh? Uh, oh, yes, uh, yes. Don't let us disturb you, Leroy, my boy. Go right ahead and do your homework. Just pay no attention to us. I won't. Uh, uh, as we were saying, Judge, uh, don't you think that juvenile delinquency often starts with some innocent boy's prank? When were we saying that? <laughs> Oh, uh, of course, Gildersleeve. Uh, Quite often, a young fella starts out for a lark and winds up in a cage. How's that? Oh, Judge. <laughs> then you think that their practical joking can lead to a serious consequences? Surely. Yeah. It starts out with a fella dipping girls' pigtails into ink wells, and then he becomes bored with that and puts firecrackers in the coal scuttle. Yes. Or water in the teacher's galoshes, and then setting them out to freeze. <laughs> Never heard of that one before. Huh? That's only good in real cold weather. Well, in summertime, you can always put flypaper on all the chairs. Yes. Yeah. With the words, kick me, printed on the back. Yeah. Say, I did that when I was in fourth grade. You should have seen the fun at recess. You know, I used to hunt for frogs during recess and put them all in the lunchboxes. <laughs> Once I made a mistake and put one in my own lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you about the time that I snagged our principal's wig with a fish pole and then hoisted it to the top of the flagpole? Oh, boy. I wish I could have seen... Oh, my goodness. What have we been saying? Huh? Leroy, don't you pay any attention to this old... Uh, say, where is Leroy? I don't know. You said pretend he wasn't here, and by George, he isn't. Yes, and a lucky thing, too. How did we ever get started talking like that again? I remember distinctly. You began it, Gildersleeve. Me? Why, you feeble little fuddle-headed fuddy-duddy. Smile when you say that, Gildersleeve. Smile? I'll laugh right out loud. <laughs> Marjorie. Hello, Pierpont. I came to see Meatball. Who? 
Meatball. You know, Leroy. Only he don't like us kids to call him Leroy anymore. Like I don't like to be called Pierpont. All right. Piggy. <laughs> Come on in. Oh, Leroy. Piggy Banks is here to see you. Come on in the library, Piggy. It's right that way. Thanks. Well, come on in. Don't be bashful. But your uncle, that's him behind that newspaper, ain't it? What's the matter with him? Oh, nothing. He always does that after dinner. He's digesting his food. Oh. Ain't we going to disturb him? No, we had roast beef and potatoes for dinner. Nothing will bother Uncle for another hour at least. <laughs> now, let's get going on that history stuff Well, I know Miss Keller's going to ask us about the vice presidents tomorrow Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure She's going through the book exactly the way she did last year The first time I took the course <laughs> Okay, I, I think I got it memorized But is she going to ask us the names of all the vice presidents? She did last year I kept a diary All right, but gee, what a question to ask well, you check the list and see if I get them right. Shoot. Sure. Uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, uh, uh, Aaron Burr... You said that. Mm. Say, Meatball, what do you think of the stuff that's been pulled off at school lately? Oh, I don't know. What do you think of it? Oh, I don't know. Have any idea who's doing it? Gee, I don't know. You got any idea? Well, I don't know. Who do you think? I don't know. Let's get back to the vice president. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, John Adams, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr, uh... Say, I wonder who put the iron sulfide in Miss Keller's inkwell. How'd you know it was iron sulfide, Meatball? Shucks, anybody knows that's the stuff that puts the smell in inkwell. You know who pulled that one, Piggy? Let's get back to Vice President. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr... Uh, oh, gee, I don't know what good knowing the vice president is going to do a guy who's going to be a stunt man in the movies. I thought you were going to be a lion tamer. Well, lion taming's just one of the stunts I'm going to do. Talking about stunts, did you hear about the one somebody just pulled tonight over in the schoolyard? Which one's that? Ah, I bet you know about it already. Well, maybe I do and maybe I don't. I ain't saying. What are you talking about? Oh, about what they did to old man Flugerhammer's statue. Somebody dressed him up in a set of red flannel underwear and a corset. No kidding. Yeah. Boy, if they ever find out who did that, they'd be expelled from school prano, I bet. <laughs> Let, let's get on with the vice president's pig. All right. Say, could I borrow a glass of water? We had corned beef for dinner. Sure. Come on out in the kitchen. I'll get it for you. Boy, wait till Mr. Proctor sees the woolies on Flugie. Uh, did I hear right? Red flannels and a corset on Flugie? Or was I just dreaming? No, there's Piggy Banks' hat. It's true. Oh, let me think. Yes, that's what I'll have to do. Yes, six. Hooker's just as much to blame as I am. I can't let Leroy be expelled. The... Hello, Judge. This is Gildersleeve. You've got to help me with something. I can't explain now, but I'll pick you up in about ten minutes. We got a date with an old schoolmate of yours. You sure this is the right part of the schoolyard? Why, of course. Not so loud, Gildersleeve. Oh. I'm a superior court judge. Can you picture what would happen if I'm caught? Yes, yeah, scandalous, isn't it? <laughs> oh, why do I let you get me into situations like this? Because you haven't got any more brains than I have. And where in the name of Goots and Borglum is that statue? Oof. Never mind, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Flugelhammer up there. Flannels, corsets and all. Let's not hang around here all night, Gillisleeve. Come on, I'll boost you up. Well, wait a minute, I take this top coat off. All right. Yeah, yeah that's better. All right, get down now. Upsie daisy. Oh. oh, my poor back. You'll cave it in. <laughs> Push my other foot up, Judge. I will if you take it out of my hip pocket. <laughs> yeah, there. Is that better? No. Ow, now it's in my ear. Well, in one ear, not the other. Gildersleeve, get up there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. What's wrong? Judge, do you notice a sudden cold wind? Ha, 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 ha.
No, can't say that I do. Which way is it coming? Up. <laughs> the judge, hold my feet so I won't fall. I got him, I got him. You're all right, solid as a rock. No, no, you're holding Pete's feet. What? The flat-footed flugelhammer. Yeah, that's better. Now I can get to work. I wonder where Leroy ever found this corset. Make it snappy, Gildersleeve. Who do you think you are, Gypsy Rose Lee? Yep. Okay, okay, I've got it now. Here, catch it, Judge. Hurry up before somebody catches us. All right. Hey, Leroy must have sewn this underwear on. I never knew the little rascal could sew. How's it coming, Gildy? Just another second. Cut out that whistling, Judge. I'm not whistling. That must be the night watchman. Come on, rip it off. Let's scram. Okay, head for the car, Judge. Uh, this way, Judge. Quit calling me Judge, Gildersleeve. Oh, oh. You. Don't you believe him, Gildy? No. Oh! Scatter, Judge, scatter. I'll meet you at the drugstore. I wonder why the principal sent for us, Uncle Mort. Well, now, you let me handle the whole thing, Marjorie. Do you think that Leroy might be in some trouble? Well, I didn't want to tell you, Marjorie, but your brother has turned his school into a midget version of Hell's a Poppin. <gasps> Leroy? But he had such a fine record. He had, until he heard Judge Hooker and me brag about the foolish antics we performed as children. Oh, I hang my head when I think of it. And I'd like to hang the judges, too. Oh, now, Uncle Mort, he can't be that serious. No? Well, come on. <laughs> You'll see. You know, after all, boys will be boys. Leroy is just a bit high-spirited. And what's wrong with that, sir? You were a boy once yourself, weren't you? Me? No. Uh, I was talking to the principal. (laughs) Rehearsing, I mean. (laughs) After you, my dear. Yes. Look at George Washington and the cherry tree. Just high spirits? Washington was a boy, too. We were all boys. Uncle, are you all right? Of course I am. No, no, I'm not. It's been a long, long time since I was called to the principal's office, but I still get that old feeling. Me too. Yeah. Well, brace up, Uncle Mort. Here we are. Okay. Let's go in. Hope he doesn't make us stay after school, Marjorie. Uh, Mr. Proctor? Yes? Uh, I'm Leroy Forrester's uncle, and this is his sister, Marjorie. Well, I'm glad to see you two. I want to talk to you about that young man. Yes, I know, Mr. Proctor. Really, he's a fine boy at heart. I realize that. There's something I want to tell you Sure, about. but you were a boy once yourself, weren't you, Mr. Proctor? Well, of course I was. Uh, you see, Marjorie, didn't I tell you? <laughs> Mr. Proctor was a boy once himself. <laughs> Probably high-spirited, too. Surely. Now, about your nephew. I hope you're not going to be harsh with him. But why should I be, Mr. Forrester? Uh, excuse me, my name's Gildersleeve. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Glad to meet you, Mr. G- Did you say Gildersleeve? Yes. Did I say something wrong? That happens to be my name. And does that happen to be your top coat hanging on that hook? Where? If... Yes. How did it happen to get here? Last night, that coat with your name in it was found by our night watchman. Oh, my goodness. Excuse me. I just remembered a dental appointment. One moment. There's something else that belongs to you. Your red flannel underwear and your corset. Corset? Why, Uncle Mort! I don't understand. Neither does Mr. Proctor. I understand only too well. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? A grown man, a big, fat, grown man, going around at night putting union suits on statues. Yes. Uncle Mort, what is this? Now, can't you explain? Sure, if I can get a word in edgewise. Actions speak louder than words, Gildersleeve. It's a lucky thing for you that Leroy Forrester is your nephew. It is? Yes. I'd expose you in a minute, but I don't want to spoil Leroy's big day. Leroy's big day? Oh, what has he done now? That's why I sent for you. Today, he's going to be presented with the Chamber of Commerce Medal as the outstanding student in Flugelhammer Junior High School. What? Leroy? Well, I knew it all along. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, I want to ask you, what is the most welcome compliment a hostess can receive? Well, I'm told it's sincere appreciation of the dishes she serves, comments on the lightness of her cakes, the flakiness of her pie crust, exclamations on how downright good everything tastes. So here's a tip for you housewives. For baking that's sure to win compliments, use delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. 
You see, parquet margarine is a genuine flavor shortening, not a bland, tasteless fat. Yes, the same delicate, appetizing taste that makes parquet margarine so delicious for table use gives added flavor to baked foods, too. And parquet mixes so easily and creams so smoothly, it's really pleasant to use. Remember, too, that parquet margarine's flavor makes pan-fried foods taste better, and it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And whether you serve delicious parquet margarine at the table or use it for cooking, you are giving your family a nutritious, wholesome energy food. Remember, too, that parquet is an excellent source of vitamin A. So give your family the benefits of this delightful, nourishing food. Serve them economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's made by Kraft. That's a beautiful medal, Leroy, and I'm mighty proud of you. But, uh... Won't you answer just one question for me, my boy? What is it, Unc? Who was responsible for all those escapades around your school? Now, Uncle Mort, I, I positively don't know. What's more, I don't want to know. And, and even if I did know, you don't think I'd squeal on my pal Piggy, do you? Uh, you're a bright boy, Leroy. Good night. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Would it bore you to hear a tale of tragic murder? Are you unwilling to sit through the telling of a strange and horrible story? The brief narrative of a man caught in a web of evil? You're not? <laughs> then, my friends, keep right on listening to the Mystery Playhouse. <laughs> heard it said many times, is of real benefit to him who possesses one. This particular sense has come to be so generally admired that it has attained the stature of a first-class virtue. Well, the fellow whom you are about to meet while, while hardly falling into the virtuous category, he does have a sense of humor. <laughs> Things like murder or hate and madness or, or someone telling him his mother just died <laughs> practically rolls him in the aisles. He loves a good ghoulish joke. Oh, and he loves to tell them too. He's about to start one now. So follow me, please, to the inner sanctum and your host, Raymond. <laughs> Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Now, come in, won't you? This is your host, Raymond, again, disturbing the peace. Say, have you ever, ever had the screaming memes? Did you ever get an attack of the yelling and wailing jitters? You walk in your sleep? You ever wake in the middle of the night shrieking at the top of your lungs? Oh, you do? Well, you must be an awfully hard person to live with. Friends, it's time for our story to begin. From this point on, forget everything pleasant. Get a finger ready to chew on. Turn the lights down low. 
and listen to Peter Lorre tell you the blood-curdling tale, Death is a Joker. Come with me to the criminal courts building. A tense hush falls upon the spectators as Charles Luther takes the stand. Gentlemen of the jury, I'm accused of murder. I'm an actor. A comedian. Look at my face. Ugly, huh? Yes, so ugly that whoever looks at it laughs. I'm not telling you this to win sympathy for myself. I, I tell you this because it is important to your understanding. The strange events that brought me to this courtroom today to plead for my life. Shortly before midnight of November 28th, I went to the apartment of my friend Robert Langwell, the famous actor in Matthew. Charles, well, this is a surprise. Come in, come in. Thank you. Would you like a drink? No, don't bother. I don't want anything. No? Well, here, may I take your thing? Mm. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Oh, George. Yes, I have the money for you. You'll be up? When? 20 minutes? Yes. Goodbye. George Galvin. You know him, Charles? Yes. Rotten actor. But an excellent poker player. So I have heard. Mm. Robert. Robert, before leaving the theater tonight, someone told me that you and Julie Winthrop are going to be married. Is it true? Yes, we'll be married in two weeks, right after my wife gets a decree in Reno. You must not marry Julie. Not marry Julie? Well, who are you to tell me what I can do? I know Julie well, and I, I also know you. That's why you must not marry her. Charles, it might be better for you to mind your own business. Julie and I are in love with each other. No, you are not. She's fascinated by your good looks. He, she's impressed by your fame, but she, she does not love you. Now, look here. We may be old friends, but I've stood all I'm going to. I... Oh, wait a moment. Hmm. I get it now. You're in love with her yourself. I? I'm in love with Julie? No, we, we are just friends. Friends? <laughs> You're madly in love with her. That's why you came here tonight, isn't it? No. <laughs> Friends. Stop your laughing. You, in love with a girl like Julie. <laughs> Why should my love make you laugh? Oh, so you admit it, huh? All right, I do. Why is it so funny? <laughs> do you think she'd have you? You, a, a clown, ugly, clumsy. <laughs> you, in love with Julie? <laughs> then Why not? Why not? You! Stop your laughing. Stop it. Can I? Look at yourself. Charles, let go of me. No. You're choking. Let go. A joke, huh? Charles. A joke. Laugh. Go ahead. Laugh now. Laugh. Oh, but... Robert! I didn't mean it! Robert! But Lord, what have I done? I rushed out of his apartment, trembling. I turned my coat color up to hide my face. The streets were crowded with people coming from the late movies and restaurants. I tried to make myself act naturally, but it was impossible. Everyone I saw, every pair of eyes that looked at me seemed to accuse me of my crime. I stopped, waited for the light to change. Paper, mister. Morning paper. Read about the Reynolds execution. Here, let me have one. There you are. I, I, I didn't know Reynolds was to be executed tonight. Yeah. They burned him. Well, he deserved it. Murdering his friend like he did. Oh, wait a minute, mister. You forgot your chain. Oh, never mind, never mind. I went to my apartment and I looked at the newspaper I'd bought. There was a photograph of Reynolds on the first page. In his face, I saw my future. The shattered hopes. The torture of the trial. The horrible, nerve-wracking experience of waiting for death. I flung the paper away. 
I went to the window. I opened it. I looked down 17 stores to the ground. <laughs> How tiny people looked. The automobile lights moved like so many fireflies. I climbed out on the edge. I braced my arms. I took a deep breath. One last look. I closed my eyes and... Doorbell rang. I hesitated a moment. I decided to answer it. I closed the window, went to the door. Hello, Charles. Julie. Why did you rush away from the theater tonight? I was anxious to talk to you. Talk to me about, about what? I, I need your advice, Charles. What's wrong? Well, it's Robert. What happened? Well, nothing happened. It, it's just that I'm not sure I love him. I'm not sure. Yes, when I'm with him, everything seems all right. He's mm. handsome and charming, but when I'm alone, I begin to wonder and to doubt. Why? Can't you guess why? Guess? You, you left someone else? Yes. Well, who is it? You. Me? Yes, that's what I came here to tell you. That's why I don't want to marry him. Me? Yes, I would have told you before, but I was so afraid of making a fool of myself. Mm. You didn't seem to care. I didn't care. Julie, this is crazy. I loved you from the moment I saw you. You loved me? Yes. But, darling, why didn't you tell me? I'll tell you. How could I? You, you are so young. So, you're so beautiful. And I look at me. Ugly, clumsy. How could I speak to you? Fools with those words. How you look means nothing to me. Nothing? Of course not, darling. How lucky we are we found out in time. In time? <laughs> in time? Oh, merciful heavens. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke. Charles, what's wrong? Oh, oh, what there's tears streaming down your face. <laughs> Charles, you're hysterical. Now stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Julian. There's something you must know. Yes, sir. Tonight I committed a murder. Murder? What are you talking about? I killed Robert. Killed Robert? Out of your mind. You don't know what you're saying. But it is true. I went to his apartment and we quarreled and I killed him. Oh, no. You told me a moment ago that you loved me. Do you still love me? Yes, Charles. And, and tell me what to do, Joy. Help me. I, I, I can't think. I, I don't know where to turn, but... What can I do, Julie? What can I do? <laughs> Pull yourself together, Charles. This may not be as hopeless as you think. Why? Was Robert alone in the apartment when you called? Yes. Were you seen entering or leaving? No. Are you sure? Yes, his apartment is on the second floor. I, I walked up and down. What time did you get there? Shortly before midnight. And what did you do before that? Went to a movie. Movie? How long did you stay there? Oh, only about 20 minutes. Do you have the ticket stop? Huh? Yes, here it is. Charles, do you realize what this means? They, they may never find out about you. Never find out? That's right. They won't suspect you since they can't know your motive. No one saw you enter or leave, and you have an excellent alibi. Motive? Alibi, Julie, do you realize what we're doing? We're talking of this as, as if we planned this crime, as, as though we were criminals. But I committed a crime, yes, but I'm no criminal. I, I didn't mean to do it. I know, darling, I know. You must think of your own life now. Oh, and mine. Yeah. Yes, Julia. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm not a criminal, but I must play the role of a criminal now. A subtle, clever criminal who is cunning enough to escape punishment. Can I do it? Can I do it, Julia? Charles, listen to me. We must find out how much the police know. Mm -hmm. 
If it's hopeless and they have found out about you, then it would be best to give yourself up. But let's not make any decisions until we know. How can we know? Did Robert expect anyone tonight? Yes, George Galvin phoned when was there. He said he'd be up in about 20 minutes. And the body must have been discovered by now. Yes, I'm, I'm sure the police must be there by this time. I think that I'll go to Robert's apartment. No, Julie, no, no. I, I don't want you to become involved. I'm already involved. But for me, this horrible thing would never have happened. The least I can do is to help you now. But Julie... Promise, promise me you'll not leave this apartment, Charles. All right. I won't be long. Julie. Yes. If something happens, if, if something goes wrong and is separated before you return, I, I want you to know that I don't know what to say to me. You don't have to say it, darling. I know what you mean. Goodbye. Goodbye. A criminal. I have to think like one, to act like one, I have to be one. What question would be asked? Where were you at 12 o'clock midnight of November 28th? Uh, I was in a movie. And the, the, here's the stub. No, no. No, they, they can see immediately that I'm lying. My voice must not tremble. I, I shouldn't be so quick with the answer. Where were you at 12 midnight of November 28th? Where was I? Let me see. Well, I, I left the theater and I went to a movie. It was a very amusing picture. <laughs> very amusing. Can you prove what you say? Prove? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it would be difficult, guy. Well, may you have to pick it stuff somewhere. Yes, here. No, let me show it to you. Here it is. Did you ever quarrel with Robert Langwell? Quarrel oh, with... We were friends. We played in many shows together. We were on the best of terms. That's all, Mr. Luther. You may leave now. Yes. I can, Pete. It is possible. I can escape punishment. Police. Can it be the police? Or maybe it is Julie. Good evening, Charles. George Gill. I know it's rather late for an unexpected visit. Yes. It is. But this is important, Charles. A matter of uh, life and death, you might say. What do you mean? Have you a cigarette? Huh? Yes, here. Thanks. What's the matter, Charles? Your hand's trembling. <laughs> it's nothing. You don't seem to be your usual self this evening. No quips, no jokes. What's wrong? I don't always feel like joking. Yes, Charles. It's strange about human nature, isn't it? Who would have ever dreamed that tonight, a few minutes before midnight, you entered Robert Langwell's apartment, quarreled mm. with him over Julie, and choked him to death? What are you talking about? Uh, you're an excellent actor, Charles. But you're wasting your talents on me. Save them for the footlights. Or the police. Police? Will you please tell me what all this is about? Still acting, hmm? Now look, Charles. You killed Robert shortly before midnight tonight. You are mistaken. I was in a movie at that time. Oh, so that's your alibi. Very clever. No, Charles. Either we discuss terms now or I go to the police. Wait. How did you find out? That is my secret. What do you want? Money. All you have on hand. All you can dig up. All right. Come with me. I I have some money in the bedroom. All right. Uh, just a moment. What is the business? Yeah. Is... Why? I'm taking no chances. Let's go. All right. Well? Where's the money? Charles, stand back or I'll fire. Stand back. No! Let go of my hand. Let go. I'll twist it. I'll, I'll twist it till the gun points to your head. There. There. Charles, let go of my hand. You don't know what you're doing. Come on. Come on. Fire now. The bullet will enter your brain. Fire. Charles. Fire. Charles, don't. I'll make you fire. I'll squeeze your fingers. Charles, let go. Come on. This is all a joke. I'll make you. Stop it. Charles. <coughs> ah. Ah. 
just a second. Just a second. Charles. Darling. Darling, there's nothing more to worry about. Everything's all right now. We can be married and go on living and never fear anything. What makes you say that? Darling, you didn't commit a crime at all. What do you mean? Robert's alive. Alive? Yes, he's downstairs now paying the taxi. Robert? Is he alive? Yes. I spoke to him about the marriage, and he was wonderful about the whole thing. Darling, aren't you happy? Our worries are all over. You can smile and be gay. That must be Robert now. Hello, Charles. Robert. I thought you were... Well, I'm not. Oh, but, but how did you, you see? Get... I fainted. George Galvin came in and brought me to. George Galvin. Did you tell George Galvin what happened? Yes, I did. Look here, Charles. As I told Julie, I'm willing to forget the whole thing if you are. Forget? Forget? Yes. It might have ended tragically, you know, but thinking it over, I realize I'm as much to blame as you are. So if you're willing to shake hands. Shake hands? Dear, now, darling, there's nothing more to worry about. <laughs> I feel so happy I could... Charles, what's the matter with you? It's... It's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury, I became a criminal all because I thought I had committed a crime and I had to think like a criminal. <laughs> My motives were those of all men. I wanted happiness and wanted marriage to the woman I loved. What would you have done in my place? And I still think I know that guy. <laughs> I wish I could place him. Well, it must be wonderful to have a sense of humor, but I don't think Charlie feels much like laughing. Do you? We'll pay a return visit to the inner sanctum and its fun-loving host, Raymond, soon, but don't go, please. Not until we drop in at the green room, where the players are rehearsing our next performance in the mystery playhouse. Come with me, please. Come, come. <laughs> Change the dressings at midnight and again in the morning, nurse. Yes, doctor. Well, doctor, what did you find? Will I be blind? Is it very bad? Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Denton. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. You... You're sure? You aren't just saying that. I'm quite sure. Valerie. Valerie, did you hear that? I... I'm not going to be blind. Valerie? Valerie, where are you? Right here, darling. Did you hear? I won't be blind. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, darling, it's marvelous. You... You don't sound very excited. Valerie, don't you realize I'm going to see again? She doesn't sound excited because I don't want you to be excited, Mr. Denton. You've got to relax. Try to sleep. Sleep? With this ungodly pain? My eyes feel as though they were on fire. That will stop as soon as the opiate I gave you takes hold. You'll be comfortable, I'm sure. Now, good night. You're going now, Doctor? Yes, I'll... I'll look in on... on your husband in the morning. Stephen. Yes, Valerie? Do you mind if I step out into the corridor for a moment? But you... You promise not to leave me. I, I'm afraid, Valerie. Everything's so dark, I... The nurse will be here, dear, if you want anything. I just want to ask Dr. Wade some questions. Questions? But he's already told us... Yes, Stephen, I know. But 
I'd like to find out about the treatment and how I'm to take care of you when we get you home, you know. Just little things. All right. But, but hurry back. I, I want you near me. I will, dear. Uh, good night, Mr. Denton. Good night, Doctor. And thank you. You're quite welcome. After you, Mrs. Denton. Thank you. I suggest we step into the consultation room across the hall. We'll have more privacy. All right. Here we are. Thank you. Well, it's been a long time, Valerie. Yes, Paul, it has. Almost ten years, isn't it? About that. Strange that you should have called me, of all people, to treat your husband's eyes. Oh, I, I was panicky, Paul. I didn't know what to do. It all happened so suddenly. Stephen was working in his laboratory at the house when suddenly I heard a violent explosion. I ran in and found him clutching his eyes and screaming, I'm blind. First thing I thought of was an ambulance. Then you... Why didn't you think of me ten years ago? That's not fair, Paul. Was it fair to turn your back on me and then to marry a man almost twice your age? Paul, please, why bring up ancient history? It isn't ancient history to me. I've never forgotten you. Paul, about Stephen's eyes. What about them? I have a feeling that you weren't telling him the truth. You're right. Oh, you mean he's not going to regain his sight? He's going to be blind? Oh, Paul. You don't expect me to be to be terribly concerned, do you, Valerie? After all, he did take you away from me. Don't be vindictive, Paul. It wasn't Stephen's fault. He didn't even know of your existence. And you never told him that we were on the point of being married. No, never. <laughs> it's rather ironic that we should meet again at the bedside of my rival. Your husband. A man who may forever walk in darkness. Don't say that, Paul. It's horrible. But unfortunately true. A moment ago, you told me not to be vindictive. I'm not, really. But if I were, I could have my fill of vengeance if I told him about us. And then told him that he'll be blind forever. You wouldn't, Paul. Or I might take another form of revenge. I could tell you that an operation is called for. A very delicate operation. Are you trying to say that there might be a chance? Yes. But supposing I refuse to perform the operation? Paul, you're joking. You can't mean that. Perhaps not. But you call me vindictive. Suppose I operate and my scalpel slips. What if he dies? That would be murder. You're not a murderer, Paul. You wouldn't risk your professional reputation. Why must you torment me this way? You really love him, don't you? Yes, I do. Then forget the things that I've been saying. I want you to think of me as a friend. I want you to trust me. I do trust you, Paul. Thank you. Now as to the possibility of surgery. Here is the situation. The transparent film over your husband's eyes, the corneas, were burned and torn by the explosion. They've been so damaged that blindness will result, even though the eyes heal. But you think an operation would cure that? Possibly, although it's a very delicate job. The injured cornea must be peeled away and replaced by a fresh, healthy one. Where can you get healthy corneas? From the eyes of the dead. Oh. It isn't quite as horrible as it sounds, Valerie. You know, dying peace, people often will their eyes for just this purpose. We maintain what we call a corneal bank. It's much the same as a blood bank, only but there's this difference. Corneal tissue can't be stored more than 48 hours. It must be fresh, or it's no good. You have some available in the bank? No, that's the trouble. I'm afraid we haven't. But there's got to be some, Paul. I don't know where, Valerie. Unless... Unless what? I was just thinking. Last night, one of the interns asked me to look at a charity case that puzzled him. 
Patient is a Hindu or a Persian named Chandra. He lives in a dirty little shack near the waterfront. Yes, Paul? I stopped by and examined him. I found him in curable condition. There's no way to save him. He won't live more than a day or two, but his eyes are healthy. You mean, you think he might... I don't know. You have to have his consent, of course. Take me to him, Paul. I'm sure I can make him understand. Oh, it may not be so easy, Valerie. He's a strange person. A mystic and a spiritualist. Let me try. Just take me to him. All right. We can go there now. Doesn't the doctor sound familiar to you? Huh? <laughs> That's right. It's Boris Karloff, up to his old tricks. I think it might amuse you to be on hand for our next performance when we present Mr. Karloff and Creeps by Night. This is Peter Lorre closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.